I'm Esther Gillies, the president of the California Social Welfare Archives, and it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to the 100th anniversary celebration of the International Institute Los Angeles, which I will fondly refer to during the day as IILA, just for the sake of syllables coming out of my mouth, IILA. Founded in 1914 to help newly arrived immigrants adjust to new lives in Southern California, IILA has helped hundreds of thousands of immigrants and other low-income people overcome the barriers they face in becoming contributing members of society. Established by the YWCA to serve women and girls coming, to, coming from Europe and the Orient, adjust to life in this country, IILA, has continued for a hundred years to serve the immigrants entered, entering our community in waves. The Japanese picture brides, immigrants from Italy, Arab immigrants, freedom fighters of the Hungarian Revolution, to name just a few. IILA was instrumental in the creation of the first Asian service center in the United States, founded one-stop immigration centers, supported repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and so much more. I really encourage you to go to the website and take a look at their remarkable uh, historical chronology. It's a timeline from 1914 to the present, listing all of the things and activities that they've been involved in for 100 years. It's just dizzying to see the amount of activity that has come from this organization. Many, many months ago, Stephen Voss connected with me uh, suggesting that the IILA and California Social Welfare Archives, which I will in the future refer to as CSWA, you can tell I've had some bureaucratic training, lots of <laughs> acronyms, join forces in the celebration of IILA's 100th birthday. Well, I had to think about that, but examining and gathering information about social welfare organizations, particularly those that have survived for 100 years, is absolutely within the mission of the CSWA. So fast forward to today and here we are, partners, wishing to provide you with an experience with two goals. One, sharing information about the resilience and resourcefulness requ required by IILA over time and other nonprofits and public organizations in dealing with immigrant populations and immigrant issues with special emphasis today on the challenges that are facing um, us in the area of immigration. And secondly, to capture the event today as an historical moment to be memorialized on film to inform and inspire current and future generations working with migrant populations. And thus you will notice that there is a camera in the room. Be aware, your questions will appear on film, so uh, be cautious, uh, but also be forthright and honest. Um, our theme today really is to take a look at global issues and look at how they impact on local communities and determine how organizations, nonprofits and public organizations in the community actually are able to respond and cope with the increased stressors of these global issues as they hit the community. Now to begin today, our keynote speaker, um, if you received some of the uh, early uh, material about the conference, you'll note that our spe speaker was identified as Eskinder Nagash. However, he connected with Stephen on, was it Wednesday, Steve? Like, like yesterday, that the HHS secretary in Washington uh, scheduled a mandatory meeting on budget issues that required his presence on Friday, the 10th of October. Therefore, he is in Washington negotiating for um, the benefits needed by the department to do the work with our immigrant populations. But never fear, um, we have with us today Ron Munia from that office who will be uh, sharing information about the broader picture of immigration in this country. 
Mr. Ronald A. Munya began working with refugees in 1980 during the Cuban Mariel boat lift and has since worked with resettlement programs for Haitians in Miami, Kurds from Iraq in Guam, the Kosovars in New Jersey, Burmese asylees on Guam, among the many populations he's served during his career. Currently, he is the Director, Division of Refugee Services, U.S. Office of Refugee Settlement. Today, he will be talking with us about current immigration issues, the history and evolution of our refugee uh, issues, and we'll also include in that discussion the current crisis of un unaccompanied migrant children entering the U.S. along our southern border after the treacherous journey across Central America and Mexico. And with that, Ron, can I ask you to come to the podium? We'll have uh, Ron speak about a half an hour if he can. I, I think you have stories that could last about two hours. But we'll, at the end of about 30 minutes or so, we'll open the floor up to questions. So make a note of your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Esther. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you mentioned, my name is Ron Munya. I'm the director of the Division of, Refu of Refugee Services in ORR in the Administration of Children and Families in the Department of Health and Human Services, which in her thing is I'm DRS, ACF, HHS, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so. I know uh, Skinder really was looking forward to being here to um, uh, celebrate your 100th an anniversary. Um, Iskinder did prepare a letter and a certificate of appreciation, and I wanted to uh, read that letter and present this uh, certificate of appreciation. So it's his words that are coming to you to start off. And so the letter says, to the past and present staff, volunteers, board of directors, clients, and friends of the International Institute of Los Angeles. On behalf of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, please allow me to congratulate you on 100 years of exceptional service to refugees and immigrants in Los Angeles. I regret that I'm unable to be there in person to extend my best wishes. As an agency on the front lines providing direct services to refugees and immigrants, unpredictable often describes your daily routine, not always knowing from one moment to the next who will walk through the door or whose family will be arriving after many years of separation. These constantly changing needs present their own unique challenges, but to say that IILA has handled it well would be an understatement. Your longstanding commitment to refugees and immigrants' well-being has become part of the fabric of the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. Your 100 years of dedication and hard work gave hope, promise, and dignity to those fleeing war and persecution. As a result of your tireless work, compassion throughout your history, countless immigrants and refugees now have a safe place to call home and a future of freedom and opportunities in the United States of America. It is my profound belief that refugees and immigrants, like others who have come before them, possess rich and inherent capabilities. With your help, OR will continue to nurture these capabilities and provide refugees and immigrants with opportunities to realize their full potential and fulfill their dreams. It is also my sincere hope that all refugees may live a life free from violence and family separation, one in which they are empowered to live freely, chart their own destiny, and contribute meaningfully to the larger community of which they are a part. I thank you again for your tremendous work towards our shared goal to ensure that the U.S. refugee program is not only one which other countries seek to emulate, but one which puts refugees first and upholds our humanitarian obligation to rescue and restore refugees' health, safety, and dignity as they become valuable members of the American society. As I extend my congratulations and appreciation to the International Institute of Los Angeles and to everyone who does their part to carry out its mission, I wish you all the best in the next 100 years and thank you again for your services to vulnerable children, refugees, and immigrants. Iskinder Nagash. 
So Steve, I don't know if you would like to step forward and accept this certificate of appreciation. A couple board members here too. A couple board members if they would like to join us. It reads, in honor, uh, Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to the International Institute of Los Angeles in honor of 100 years of outstanding service to the community, providing hope and new beginnings to the refugees who make it their home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We wanted to have a more substantial award, but you know, Skinder's trying to fight for a budget, and <laughs> we're broke. <clears throat> wow, since 1914. And I had to stop to think about that. First of all, you all look great for 100 years. <laughs> 1914, it happens to be the year that my grandparents came to this country. And that was just also just in front of World War I, the world to end all wars. And they stop to think of all the things that have happened in that past hundred years, wave after wave. You know, we had the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, and then another World War. And that's where my father served in, in, um, in Europe, and other members were in the other part of, of the, the war. There was the Korean War, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and another Cold War. It never seemed to end. And with each, more refugees and immigrants sought peace and freedom in this land of opportunity. And through the decades, IILA has been there helping the refugees and immigrants. Today, it's almost impossible to imagine a Los Angeles without Koreatown, Little Tokyo, or Boyle Heights. Not as neighborhoods separate from the city itself, but as an integral part of the multicultural mosaic the city has become and indeed this very country. A hundred years of service is significant accomplishment by any measure, but services in the face of these ever-changing populations and the economic swings and the needs of the populations is even more notable. There's other one historical note, I don't know if it made it into your timeline, but you are one of 340 resettlement agencies around the country right now you're also the only one to, that has ever had two of its directors go on to be directors at the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you like DC? <laughs> <laughs> or our story began uh, in earnest, probably in 1979. I'm going to take you back through a little historical context and show how the kind of waves and how the program has evolved and the different responses that uh, OR has um, been challenged to meet and certainly, again, in partnership with its resettlement agencies and a host of other service providers throughout the country. <clears throat> then I'm also going to uh, have plenty of time for questions and answers and as uh, Steve and I have kind of kindred spirits from dating back to uh, the Mario Boatlift, I'd be more than happy to not only answer some questions, but tell some of the stories of the challenges that worked with all these different populations. Uh, when es Esther mentioned that I was working with these populations, uh, there are five times in the history of the Office of Refugee Resettlement when we have done in-country processing. And so the Mario, Litos, uh, the Cubans that came in in 1980. I then went down to Miami and worked with Haitians that were arriving. Uh, in 1996, I was out on Guam for nine months after the first war with Iraq where we processed some 7,000 Iraqi Kurds. Two years later, it was the war in the Balkans and we had the Kosovars and they were processed in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Two years later again, I was with uh, back out in Guam with the Burmese asylum seekers. And OR has also had other things such as the repatriation of the Lebanese Americans in the war over there and through our repatriation program uh, recently with the Haitians. 
these are all kind of things that are outside of OR's normal duties, but they're very much a part of it. Normally in the refugee resettlement program, State Department handles overseas operations where all the processing is handled. As State Department is overseas, we're the domestic program. So anytime it happens on U.S. territory, including the island of Guam, ORR is the lead agency that, that happens to respond, and I've been uh, truly blessed to go out to those things, even though it often means working 16-hour days for months on end uh, to get the job done. So go back to uh, 1979. Uh, I just returned from the Peace Corps. There were, Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States, and he wanted to address the hundreds of thousands of refugees that were in camps that had fled Southeast Asia for refugee camps in the Philippines, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Thailand. That year also, the Soviet Union uh, purged itself of some 25,000 Jews, mostly elderly people. The response to that, uh, through the efforts of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, was to create the matching grant program. So in fact, if you've been participating ever in that program, this program actually precedes the creation of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And it was when all of these kind of things happened that Jimmy Carter decided he wanted to double the number of refugees coming into the country and to create a very organized plan to do this whole thing. And so uh, a lot of the key players uh, that came in, a whole bunch of different states. I mentioned Ed Silverman, who is the state coordinator of Illinois, who is, uh, has just retired. He was also one of the founders and writers of this uh, rather impressive doc document known as the Refugee Act of 1980. That's what brought all of these programs together. It created the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the state refugee coordinators programs, the guidelines for refugee cash and medical assistance. And if only we could provide 36 months, which is, which is in the act, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And different social services and the like. It's a beautiful piece of legislation. It's on our webpage, and it's still in force today. And in that year, when he wanted to double the numbers, our country brought in over 200,000 refugees. Okay. But no sooner had that ink dried than a crisis with Cuba led to more than 125,000 Cubans and some 20,000 Haitians coming to the U.S. Uh, shores in Florida in a matter of just a few months. How do you respond to such a huge crisis? Well, the first thing you did was they commandeered the Orange Bowl, the football stadium, and refugees were packed in over there. They set up circus tents on the edge of the Everglades. They then opened up Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, which had been served, uh, had previously served in processing a lot of the Vietnamese uh, refugees that were coming from Southeast Asia. And that is where, in fact, Steve, as I said, my kindred spirit started over there. As the re Cubans continued to come in unabated, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, another army base, was opened and finally followed by Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. Fidel Castro, embarrassed by the huge number of Cubans leaving the country, said, well, they have the cream, now we'll give them the crud. And so as people were getting on the boats and families were coming to reunite and pick up their family members, they were ordered to take uh, people that were deemed undesirables. Those were people that uh, Castro emptied his jails and he emptied his mental institutions and he cleaned the streets of anybody he didn't think believed in La Revolucion. It was late in that summer that as we had prioritized the different uh, families that had uh, the refugees that had come that had families, we prioritized them and got them reunited with their families, that the whole feeling in the camps changed radically, and in every single one of those camps there was rioting that went on. Uh, Bill Clinton, who was governor of Arkansas at the time, lost his bid for re-election, as did Jimmy Carter, and much to that had to do with what was going on over there. And that's where my summer started. Uh, it was going to be a summer job and hasn't quite ended yet. 
And now some three decades later, the US government has brought in more than three million refugees to our, our shores and hundreds of thousands more asylees, Cuban Haitian entrants, and a host of other immigration statuses that have been created and served by us, such as the Amerasians, the immigrants from Amerasia, the special immigrant visa holders and the like. This year, which just ended on September 30th, 70,000 refugees were resettled uh, from more than 50 different countries and almost as many languages. And so when I think of the challenges at the local resettlement site, wow, to be able to have the ability to provide the culturally and linguistically appropriate services that we talk about is truly a challenge. And so I love coming to different places like the International Institute here in LA because, you know, I, I, in fact, I encourage you to do an inventory and see how many different languages are spoken here if you haven't. And that's true in resettlement agency as you go around the country. They all change a little bit, and they need to because you certainly can't have 50 languages spoken in your office. Our office does have over 30 languages spoken, even though we don't work directly with clients, but we bring a lot of former refugees into the office and people that have a lot of overseas experience. On top of those 70,000 refugees, we had more than 20,000 Cuban Haitian entrants, more than 20,000 asylees, several thousand survivors of torture. Many people don't know that the Office of Refugee Resettlement has a particular program just for survivors of torture, and you do not need to even be a refugee. In fact, you could be an American citizen. We have over 30 centers around the country and several uh, technical assistance providers just to address that particular group. We also have the Victims of Human Trafficking Program. And these are people that are brought in and go through the legal process and uh, the children can immediately come into our programs and be served under special programs. And the adults actually agree to work with law enforcement agencies in attempting to address the issues of the traffickers so that we can you know, finally put a, a, uh, try to get a, a grip on that and put a stop on that. We also have the repatriation program. Uh, that's a program that probably people don't even know that we have, but if an American citizen, if you as an American citizen were to get into trouble overseas and be destitute, whether it be for whatever personal reason might be, or if there's a natural disaster or an unnatural disaster, such as the uh, hurricane in Haiti or the uh, war in Lebanon uh, about five years ago, ORR is the lead agency in bringing American citizens back to this country and back into their communities. So it's a program that is ongoing and it's a unique program to them. So all told, my estimate is that this past year we served approximately 160,000 new arrivals. And if that math didn't add up, it's because I have yet to mention the unaccompanied children's program. This year, we brought in 58,000 and change children that crossed the border uh, from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador as the <coughs> principal countries, but others, others were also there. A little history on the unaccompanied uh, children's program is this program was created back in 2003 with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and the disassemblage of the Immigration and Naturalization Services. It was advocates, advocate agencies such as International Institute of LA and national resettlement agencies that petitioned Congress to say that we shouldn't have children in immigration detention facilities. It's not safe, it's not good, we have to do better and we can do better. And the agency that should be doing this is the Office of Refugee Resettlement, who also does the Refugee Minors Program, along with our other populations, of course. So for a number of years, uh, so that's how the program came to us, and for a number of years, we would average five, six, seven thousand 7,000 children a year crossing the border and being given to OR for, um, for custody. In 2008, legislation was signed under the previous administration and unanimously passed by Congress 
that requires DHS to turn over the children to OR custody within 72 hours. Now, when was the last time you heard anybody say that Congress unanimously passed anything? You know, especially on such a touchy subject. And I say that because the news you hear right now is often that we, it's the Obama administration doing this and why doesn't he change things and a whole host of you know, vitriol in some cases or just lack of information. But in fact, this is the legislation that was passed under the previous administration and we are following those same guidelines. And we're trying to do that while we have not been given necessarily the adequate funds to do that. But through those years, OR met those challenges, and when the numbers were small, that was not much of uh, a big burden for the Office of Refugee Resettlement. In 2012, that number jumped from the 7,000 to nearly 14,000, somewhat inexplicably. The following year, it nearly doubled again to 25,000. If you're a recipient of any one of our grants, you saw that we had a fiscal problem that year, and the only way that we were able to do that was to rob Peter to pay Paul. And that means is that in those years, and starting then, and continuing through the present, we were not able to give you full funding out of the federal fiscal year because we had to divert funds to pay for those unaccompanied children and the expenses that went with that. So you've been getting 58% of your grant from the year that uh, the fiscal year when we make the awards and you always get that 42% that actually comes from the next year's budget. And those are for our discretionary programs and a host of other ones. All right, this year, as you know, we were headline news for weeks on end. In one month, in the month of June, I believe, 11,000 children came. It's more than we had in all those years, uh, the average for all those years, all in one month. We had a number of days when more than 500 children were coming on a daily basis. It was peaking. And I'm sure you saw the pictures of children sleeping on the floor at the Bureau uh, of uh, Border Patrol facilities before being turned over to ORR. And as a result, ORR was frantically working with the Federal Emergency Management Agency and with the Department of Defense to open up their facilities so that we could take care of this uh, surge of arrivals. That worked rather dramatically, and it appears that efforts with uh, the Mexican government has now s dra dramatically slowed down the number of arrivals, though, of course, we don't know how long that will continue. I get daily reports, and uh, it's right now that's about 50 to 60 children a day are now being uh, apprehended at the border and referred over to ORR. ORR has placed with, uh, of these 58,000, virtually all have been reunited with their families and, um, or in sponsors if they did not have one, but the very vast majority have family here that they are being re reunited with. These children will face deportation hearings, proceedings, and will likely seek asylum from the violence in their country for which they have fled. And the courts will decide their fate and whether they have adequate or any legal representation remains to be seen and that is certainly one of the challenges that we all kind of look at to see what is fair, what is a responsible way to handle these cases. So what should we plan for this year? There is a new presidential determination that was signed just last week. The presidential determination is when the president signs a document and he authorizes the number of refugees that can come into this country. This year, as in previous years, he has signed that total to be, he has authorized up to 70,000 refugees to come in. This is the same number that has been in the past. For asylees, we don't know. Just like you don't know, if they show up at your door looking for services, we find out that uh, pretty much the same way. Uh, not all asylees need services from our service providers, but certainly a good percentage of them do come to ORR, 
and actually to your, your agencies and your doors looking for services and help. Cuban Haitians, again, we expect that the same number uh, will arrive. Anything, of course, can change. As for the unaccompanied minors, it's very hard to say. One of the reasons that Skinner's not here with you today is due to discussions on planning for the coming year for these undocumented children. One thing that is different in the presidential determination this year is that it mentions Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador specifically for in-country processing. That's different than that's ever been in there before. It's, uh, there, it is allowed in certain places, uh, other countries as Cuba and Iraq, where processing is done in country. Other than that, of course, the definition of a refugee is somebody who's fled their country and cannot return because they have a well-founded fear of persecution. This authorizes the you know, processing so that they don't have to hop on a train and sit on the top of the train, which nobody sees as a good way to leave a country and flee. Of course, we have other initiatives in the refugee program. Uh, the administration continues to put LGBT as a priority, and ORR strongly supports that and has with the um, Heartland Alliance. And as you can see, almost on a daily basis, the gains made in this country on LGBT rights is spreading around the country. And yet, as we know, that there are many countries where if you are gay, it is punishable by death and sometimes very brutal death. And gay rights are human rights and they need to be protected. Healthcare is another top priority for the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And as a result, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the Skinder has created a new division, a division of refugee health. Uh, we had been, we had had a person from the Center for Disease Control with ORR for the past couple years, and now that same person, Dr. Curry Kim, has uh, become a full member of the OR staff and has uh, been named the director of the Division of Refugee Health. Under her, they have revised and updated our domestic medical screening guidelines and enhanced our outreach to state refugee health coordinators. They've also worked to explore different ways where we can improve the overseas medical screening. This division is also changed with staying abreast of changes through the Affordable Care Act. As you know that this has been now in one year and uh, there are states where, well, you know, the, the mosaic around the country. Some places it is, some places it isn't, and refugees are caught up in this whole mix and sometimes the documentation that they are required to present is not, they don't have it as yet. So we're working with, um, uh, with CMS in HHS, sorry about that, <laughs> to kind of rectify these things and also with the different states. ORR has continued to expand its home-based child care program, something I believe was started right here at International Institute of LA under when the Skinder was here. In this program, ORR focuses on single mothers who otherwise would likely face a difficult time trying to support themselves and achieve economic self-sufficiency, often with very limited re services and resources. The home-based childcare program attempts to change that whole scenario and assist mothers to become entrepreneurs in daycare in their homes and enable other refugees to work confident that their children are well taken care of. OR is working with the TANF programs across the country and if you didn't know, TANF was created under the Clinton administration out of the former AFDC program in 1996. States now set the parameters for eligibility for TANF, as well as the monthly allotments. One thing I was rather startled to learn as I went back and did some research, and I think you'll be surprised to learn, that since its creation in 1996, more than half of the states have not increased their payment levels a nickel in all those years. So whatever you got in 1996 is what you're getting right now. Some states have even decreased it. And we also know that through our regulations is that our refugee cash assistance payments are pegged to the TANF program. 
And so when they make changes over there, the corresponding refugee cash assistance is awarded to these different, uh, to the folks. Of course, in many places, that is woefully inadequate. The state of Texas, when the refugees go there, nobody goes on TANF. They pay $270 for a family of three, and that's to survive on. Consequently, in Texas, the RCA level would be, again, totally inadequate, and that state has become a public-private partnership program where we artificially inflate the re refugee cash assistance level. We can do that under the regulations for RCA clients, but we can't do it for the TANF-like clients. So our solution on that is that everybody that would be eligible for TANF can now go into the matching grant program. And so the matching grant program is the dominant program. It's about 50% of the folks in the TANF that would be 50% of the arrivals will go into the matching grant program, 50% go on to PPP, RCA type. And that's true in a number of states around the country, and it's one of the ways that we have to constantly kind of make adjustments to it, to our program, so that we can give people a, a, at least a fighting chance you know, in terms of their services. The matching grant program outcomes have been increasing steadily. Uh, over the past few years. When we first started capturing the data at 180 days, in around 2007, we were up to 80% of the clients that entered the program were economically self-sufficient by the time they left the program, which means that they were able to earn enough money to pay for their basic expenses. That number dropped when we had a slide in the economy and it dropped down into the high 60s, and we're bucking up around close to 75% right now of all clients going in into that program that I'm doing that. We also have the Refugee Agricultural Partnership Program. I don't know if you have one here in Los Angeles. We only fund 10 programs, but we have, and it's only a million dollar program, which for us is a very small program. Michelle Obama did come to the program in San Diego, an IRC program, and just marveled at the program and said it was a model for the community and a model for the country, in fact, a model for the world. And it really is a wonderful program. Uh, it's where we're setting up gardens, often on empty lots in communities, uh, fighting with uh, mayoral offices to change the ordinances so that they can have these kind of gardens. We get them set up. We partner with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, they bring in their EBT machines, and we set up farmers markets on the weekends. And so the refugees are growing food with other members of the community alongside. The kids are playing together. They're sharing food. They're selling food. They're making food for each other, breaking bread together. All of these are the things that make integration probably in the over overall program, probably one of the most effective ways of doing it. It's an absolutely marvelous program. And I say that because when you look at Chicago, where we have another huge program, uh, we had an interview with a client, and she said, you know, prior to the gardens that were created there, she would work in matching grant. She got a job through that, so she worked in a uh, hotel at night. So she would commute about two hours, get to her job, work those hours at night, turn around, commute back, go into an apartment complex where hardly anybody spoke her language. And she also got food stamps. And so U.S. agriculture says, success. ORR said, self-sufficient, that's success. But it's a pr pretty miserable life and pretty fragile in terms of what is real economic self-sufficiency. When the garden came, instead of going home, they go to the garden. They meet their friends. It's where the elderly go. It's where the kids go. It's where families go. Not just from one particular ethnicity, though in some cases that tends to be the case, but in many cases, and certainly in Chicago on the north side, people are coming from all over, including the people that are just have been born here and lived their entire lives here for generations, perhaps. And they get into this community garden 
and suddenly people have a place to go, healthy, good food. And when you stop to think that what people otherwise spend their money on with their food stamps, good food is a very good alternative. ORR is reaching out to mainstream <laughs> providers, recognizing that we cannot that we cannot do all the work alone. Refugees are eligible for most mainstream programs, yet in many cases they've been ignored. In many cases the TANF program does exactly that. When you look across the country, refugees make up a tiny, tiny fraction of a percentile, in many cases, of the TANF caseload. And states kind of look at it and they say, why would we want to expend such an inordinate amount of resources for this population. We don't have the language capability. We don't have all these other things to do with it. It's too much of a burden for us. We don't need to do that. We need to focus on the other folks. And of course, for our program, they're all refugees for us and we need to do whatever we can to help those have the same opportunities. Our country has had a long history of refugee assistance and, uh, and support. It's enjoyed bipartisan support throughout the decades. But I have to say that we seem to be, uh, things seem to be changing, and certainly in an election year. And I can't tell you how close we came to dodging a very crucial bullet this year. Congress did not give us additional funds that were requested by the President to deal with the unaccompanied children crossing the border. We did not receive additional funds after uh, January when we did re receive additional funds. We did not anticipate those numbers to go as high as they did. How could we? So what we had to do is reprogram refugee service money to the unaccompanied children's program and then wait to see if there would be enough money at the end of the year. That came incredibly close to the end of the fiscal year. I think it was September 15th when they noticed that they, they finally said the money had been reprogrammed back and we were able to fund our programs. What that meant was that if you have a grant with ORR, or you had applied for a new one, if we did not get that money, you would not have gotten that money. In other words, if you had a three-year grant, the grant was over because it's always subject to the availability of funds. And if you can stop to think with your uh, microenterprise programs, your IDA, your home-based child care, all sorts of refugee school impact, everything, boom, would be, have been gone in a flash. And when that happens, communities would react right, quite negatively, and we could very well have lost the refugee program. Refugees embody strength, perseverance, courage, and hope. Most of them would not have survived the journey here otherwise. In fact, many did not. They walk through your doors as the first steps to a whole new bewildering life. I implore you to help them reach their dreams, start their businesses, care for their loved ones, ensure that their children have the chance to grow and succeed, free from the specter of violence and persecution that their parents risked all to escape. Make your connections in the community, make your voices heard, extend the welcoming hand and warm smile to the clients and really mean it. Now perhaps more than ever, this program needs your focal support for those it touches. Promote the sense of welcoming in the community and it will naturally extend upwards and outwards. So on behalf of the Skinner de Grash, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all that you do and happy anniversary, International Institute of Los Angeles. Thank you. Will you entertain some questions? I will entertain any questions you like, and if not, I'm gonna have to tell you some more stories if we have time. Yes, sir. Uh, this past year, it was $1.5 billion. Um, I'd say probably, uh, I don't have the exact figures, but probably six or seven hundred uh, million of that was um, for the
for the unaccompanied children's program. Okay. Yes, sir, Alex. I, okay, the question was how many, of the 58,000 unaccompanied, undocumented children that came in, how many were gang involved? I have no idea on that one. Uh, there are probably some. We have had some facilities actually that were secure facilities. But I would say that the vast, vast majority are not. In fact, they are fleeing the same folks, um, the, the gangs that are down there. One of the things that has happened over the past few years is that we're deporting many of the gang members that have been here in the United States back over there, and now they're setting up shop and uh, you know, recruiting new gang members, and for that, one of the reasons that many of the children are fleeing. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I was surprised to read it. And so I have no idea, and from what I've talked, I don't know anything at all. That would be a State Department uh, issue in the first place. It would not be an ORR thing, since we're domestic and do not have anything there. But it was interesting to see that in there. It was one of the things I thought of way back when we were trying to do some brainstorming. I said, rather than have these kids do that, if we could do in-country processing so that people would not have to risk their lives um, getting on these trains where uh, many of these children are being raped, uh, and uh, you know, extorted for money and all of the problems that go through it. So um, uh, anything would be a better solution than having them come that way. And in processing certainly is a positive step in that direction. Yes, sir. All right, well, if they were uh, released, Question. okay, uh, it's a little bit out of my, my league, but I'll, I'll attempt on this. Um, somebody who is released, presumably from prison in North Korea, and how would they? Or in prison, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that would be a whole other issue, and I would have to ask State Department to kind of address that when people are in there. If somebody is, if you were in an accident, if you were mugged and something happened uh, or you're incarcerated and finally released and now you're able there and you're destitute in that country, you would go to a U.S. Embassy and ask for help. The U.S. Embassy would actually have you sign a loan, transport you back, you would be met at the airport and then our program would take you to whatever um, place that you would, you know, your original residence or where you have family and there would be assistance, a certain amount of services that would be provided to get access perhaps to uh, uh, public assistance of some sort. Yes, ma'am, if needed. Well, that's um, the question is uh, addressing the different contracts that we have under the uh, undocumented children's program for providing services to them. Uh, it's not my division, so I'll just kind of put that out first of all. We do have, uh, we had a program announcement making uh, X number of million dollars available for different shelters of different sizes. Uh, and the like, and that gets uh, people submit their, their proposals to it. I don't know if we allow private contractors in that because our legislation under or our regulations is that they have to be uh, for nonprofit agencies. Uh, of course, then people do contract out for, you know, 
craft services and life or whatever it's like there. Uh, I don't know of anything, I don't know that I can say too much more on that, but um, we make out the awards. My concern right now is, you know, do we have enough or do we have too much? And that's a real challenge. What, what, what number should we work with this year? And my fear is okay, uh, well one fear is that all the beds would be full. The other fear is all the beds would be empty. You know, it's one of those things in government, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You know, so you have to figure out which way to go. You know, and you don't have good information and nobody has good information. You don't know what's going to happen. So you plan as best you can and that's what a Skinder's doing right now. So if he were here, he'd probably give you a very different answer, but he's privy to a lot more information on that than, than I am. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Okay, the, um, the question is uh, regarding or are putting people in the HHS regional offices and not working with them. When ORR was created, OR had staff in regional offices for many years and it was there for probably about 15 years and then it was all brought into uh, headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Skinder wanted to have uh, ORR staff closer to the different states and we don't, we already have state refugee coordinators but we felt that if we put them in the regional offices we can work with all those different organizations including an ACF and HHS to better coordinate and provide different services and get staff to uh, different town hall meetings and participate and make sure that things are going well and be a voice for refugees and for the office. So we are moving to putting somebody in each of the regional offices. Those um, offices are already set, so it's, it's out in Sacramento rather than um, you know, here in Los Angeles, but that's you know, the nature of California, but they would be free to travel around. Uh, we do have people in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth area, which is another regional office headquarters. Chicago's another one, Boston's another, uh, Atlanta, and we already have staff and we're proceeding to add staff over there. In likelihood, it would take the role of the state, uh, uh, state liaisons that we have in the Division of Refu Refugee Assistance, instead of having them in our headquarters, they'd be out in the regions. So that's the, the goal on that, to have a closer feet on the ground to the issues. Yes, ma'am. Could you repeat your question a little bit? Well, there are the commitment for trafficking victims. I think it is is very strong, and it's uh, it's actually growing it in internationally as well as nationally. We have our own program in the Office of Refugee Resettlement where they provide different services prior to being certified as victims of human trafficking. So we have a, you know, a certain select services that are provided to people prior to that stage. Once somebody is given a, is certified as a victim of human trafficking by our office, they're eligible for all of the programs that a refugee uh, can get, so matching grant, microenterprise, individual development accounts, uh, and the like, so. 
Okay. Any other questions? Last one. Oop. All right. The gentleman over here. I had to get one more in here first. Yes. <laughs> in terms of, um, <clears throat> so when the state tried to force a retirement, it was not as effective. Objectively, objectively, it cost them a ton of money. Such a high rate of health on the United States. Um, wasn't the retirement opportunity beneficial to the business owners, but such a constraint for such a high earner or who are more receptive if the plan is not adopted? So that you can actually go talk to the top minds of businesses about a formula um, kind of instead of seeking grant money to run programs to train our earners, um, here's the plan that a state or a town might be able to implement, and most of that funding is retirement. Well, <coughs> part of the resettlement process is that agencies such as yours over here would reach out to the communities and talk about the resettlement agency. Every, every state has a state refugee coordinator. When you talk about places like uh, Mississippi, there are hardly any refugees that go over there. Many of the southern states are states that have extremely low refugee cash assistance payment levels and TANF payment levels, and uh, sometimes there's really lack of job opportunities there for folks, and so it's not a big place. Texas, and I, and I wanna make sure we make a distinction because it is a distinction that people, certainly at the higher echelons make uh, in state governments as well. You know, Arizona and, and say and Texas are very concerned about people crossing the borders, and they're not documented. Who are they? What is our control over thing? That's a very different thing than the refugees that are brought into the country. And in fact, Texas uh, has some of the best outcomes for refugees, and it is one of the largest resettlement sites. You know, in Phoenix. Um, the mayor of Phoenix loved the agricultural project that we put over there so much that he dedicated 15 acres of city land and gave IRC control over it to make a giant community garden. And so clearly, this is a place where they look and they see refugees and our resettlement agencies as bearing, being a very positive impact on the community. So you have to kind of make that, that distinction there and it's a very big one. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ron, thank you so much. That was a very uh, densely packed one hour with incredible amounts of information. Thank you again. Very, very informative. We're going to move to our uh, first panel of the day, and we'll take a break after this panel presentation. And we move from uh, the global aspects presented to us by Ron to the more local issues that are created by the influx of large numbers of immigrants in our local communities. And speaking in behalf of local communities today, we're going to begin with uh, Stephen Voss, who is the current uh, President and CEO of International Institute of Los Angeles since 1993. It's almost forever, Steve. <laughs> IILA offers services through its multilingual staff from 18 locations to low income families and children needing childcare, isolated and frail seniors needing nutritional meals and advocacy, immigrants seeking asylum and citizenship, victims of human trafficking refugees fleeing all parts of the globe in search of protection and freedom, and unaccompanied and undocumented youth fleeing violence and abject poverty seeking protection within the U.S. Steve will share some of the history of International Institute and discuss the agency's resiliency and adaptability uh, to the ever-changing needs of immigrant populations in Southern California with particular emphasis on the current challenge presented by the unaccompanied migrant uh, minors. Steve? 
And Steve will talk about 20 minutes, and then we'll provide time for questions before we have Alex talk about uh, Children's Bureau. Thanks very much, Esther. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here today. Uh, it's a privilege for me, frankly, to, be, to have been associated with an organization that's now celebrating 100 years. Uh, Esther was kind enough not to imply that I was one of the original founders in 1914, but, uh, but I do go back a ways. Um, when we began to contemplate how we wanted to celebrate our centennial this year, uh, we created a committee, the chair of which is uh, John O'Malley, who's sitting at this table right here. And we said, instead of the kind of traditional, if uh, predictable, <laughs> Uh, sit-down dinner fundraisers, let's see if we can leave a different kind of a legacy. And by that, uh, we came to mean a kind of exchange like this where we could have uh, leaders in the community share with you not only how they've worked with immigrants and refugees, but in a number of cases with our panelists today, how they have worked with their local communities in very innovative and responsive ways. So what we said is, in addition to the centennial aspect, and I'll get into a, a thumbnail of our history a little bit, uh, let's see if we can tease out some of the kind of leadership lessons learned, not only through our own experience in 100 years, but what seems to be obvious uh, about those lessons that have been learned by some of our other panelists today. So we have a diverse group of panelists, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, I want to thank Esther, uh, who's the president of the California Social Welfare Archives. I want to thank John O'Malley, who's our uh, board committee chair for our centennial. I want to thank Lillian Alba for, for her help and her staff's help in a lot of behind the scenes work here today. And especially I want to thank all of you for taking your time, either as a panelist or as a, uh, an audience member, uh, to help us see what we can learn from those hundred years and make a good application of those learnings in the next 100 years to come. Um, our panelists today really all share one thing in common, and that is in their respective organizations, some from nonprofits, some from government, some from foundations, some from the academy, uh, they have all in their way transcended what the original mission might have been for their organization, the original game plan, if you will, and said, what's going on in our community and what do we need to do about that to remain responsive to those emerging needs? Uh, as may be clear, once you get a little better picture of our history, if we were focused on the same thing today that we were focused on 100 years ago, we would be largely out of step. And so part of what we wanted to do was assemble a group of people who could say, here's how I have, uh, in my leadership role with my organization, used those resources and you marshaled those, uh, those uh, assets to be more responsive to the communities that we serve. And so some of the people you will hear from today uh, will not in any real direct way say, here's how I've worked with immigrants and refugees. They'll tell you how they've worked with the surrounding community in a way that's very inspiring and that's why we asked them to come. Others have said, I'm working with a particular subgroup who has exceptional needs. They're in incarcerated children, uh, what they share in common with those young folks who've come across the border recently is they have been incarcerated in a way that they probably didn't anticipate. And what are some of the issues behind that and what are some of the issues uh, insofar as how gang involvement, both here and in Central America, for example, impact how we serve folks and how we best meet their needs. So those are some of the differences uh, and some of the common uh, aspects of what I wanted to address today. So part of my remarks will be a retrospective, just to sketch out a little bit of how we have uh, evolved over the last hundred years in our service delivery, uh, how we think about our work how we think about uh, what we are doing in this collective enterprise to help uh, improve the lives of those we serve. And then, as I said earlier, uh, look at some of the lessons learned that we think uh, shape the organizations who you'll be hearing from 
and how they have used those learnings and those, uh, those, uh, those tendencies, shall we say, to go beyond their original limitations, their original uh, agendas, their original uh, uh, mission statements to become more uh, responsive to the communities. Has been mentioned earlier today, think back of uh, what you know about the year 1914. Uh, the world was at war. In fact, it was a war that by most objective, if not kind of uh, startling statistics, was extremely brutal. Uh, some folks referred to it as the war to end all wars, as if nothing else, a hope that nothing that brutal would, uh, would recur. I'm sorry to say we all know that that, uh, that, that hope was not realized. Um, Hundreds of thousands of survivors of war fled their countries. Some of them crossed borders. Some of them crossed continents. Some of them crossed oceans. And many of them came to the United States. And it was about that time that the founders of, of what is now International Institute came together and said, what are these changing needs we are seeing uh, among those who are uh, crossing our portals, so to speak? Uh, what do we need to know that's different? What do we need to know about their needs and their particular backgrounds uh, to better equip us to meet their really unique needs, needs that had not been particularly well addressed or recognized before that. Um, at that time, the world was really becoming kind of irrevocably uh, changed. Uh, the world has really so radically changed in that period of time that today we almost take for granted uh, the presence of wars around the world. And that's a sad state of affairs, but it happens to be uh, our mentality. And so what we have done instead then is to, uh, at a minimum, prepare institutions for dealing with those sad realities. And part of what the International Institute is about is recognizing how the world has changed and how we need to be in a position to help folks who've been displaced make a new start in the United States. Okay. When those newcomers were initially resettled by International Institute or served by them, uh, what we did is a kind of a, we developed a, a two-prong kind of an approach to our work. One is we had uh, what were called uh, nationality secretaries a word that today probably means almost nothing to most of us. But what the historical record seems to suggest is that the Institute hired a number of people who were bilingual and bicultural, who knew not only the language of the folks they were serving, but had some familiarity with their cultural background and some of their experience internationally. And the Institute was really built on that idea, even today, I would say probably 95% of the employees at the International Institute at least speak two languages, if not more. Um, and the great bulk of them have been immigrants and refugees. And so we've built the organization on the strength of that kind of uh, being in tune with the particular needs and, and uh, issues faced by immigrants and refugees. The other prong, shall we say, of the strategy was much broader. It was, uh, it was referred to as cultural preservation. What the um, founders aimed to do was a very difficult thing, something that even now in uh, 2014 still kind of vexes us in so far as how do we strike the balance that we began to try to strike at International Institute 100 years ago. What am I talking about? they had a very purposeful plan to help preserve and celebrate the original cultures and languages that people brought from overseas. Uh, that was not a highly and widely embraced strategy back then. And in many quarters today, it's not a highly embraced uh, strategy either. Um, the International Institute, if it stands for anything, literally says we celebrate diversity. We think it's a good and laudable thing. We think it is a backbone 
of the strength and the integrity of our country, and we want to help people do two things that might seem to be uh, mutually in incompatible. What is that? To retain one's own self-respect for the cultural background that someone brings, to celebrate the strengths and beauties of those various cultures. We did things like uh, teach children how to retain their parents' language. As most of you know, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, my daughters were born in Vietnam, and uh, my Vietnamese is almost as good as theirs. Uh, because it's such a challenge in the environment in which we live that uh, one does retain that. Um, we had cultural exchanges where people came and celebrated the traditional holidays that were not necessarily celebrated in the United States. And so the Institute was a point as a hub, a convener, uh, a place where people could come and engage in activities where, one, they would see people from their own homeland and, and celebrate their own traditions and cultures. Uh, but also, we helped create and spin off formal organizations that some of which uh, exist today uh, that are much more self-sustaining and autonomous, uh, but they exist for similar reasons, and that is to retain that cultural aspect. That was not the entire picture for the cultural preservation. The other half was to help people realize that they have now made a big change in their lives. That change has really committed themselves, particularly their children, uh, to adapting new ways. What our approach was is in, instead of saying you have to throw out the old to embrace the new, we said no, you have to do, you have to work twice as hard, if you will, um, and uh, help the newcomer realize that by learning English, by learning uh, applicable job skills in the United States, by learning about the culture, they are going to be setting the framework and the path forward for themselves and their, and their children for uh, decades and decades to come. So that kind of cultural preservation, there's a, a fair amount written about it in the historical records of the international movement. And uh, they really struggled with that. Uh, they were clear that they wanted to do both, uh, help people embrace their new culture and be good s contributing citizens, if you will, uh, but also not at the expense of recognizing their own background. Let me give you a little bit of uh, a thumbnail of, of some of our historical uh, work. Um, in 1925, the Institute opposed new and restrictive laws that reduced the number of immigrants and increased immigration problems and hardships on separating immigrant families. In 1930, of course, we had the Great Depression. There was widespread uh, unemployment. And so the Institute engaged in part in helping find jobs for newcomers who tended to be last hired and first fired because of the uh, barriers that they faced. Uh, in 1939, we celebrated our 25th anniversary, happened to burn our mortgage papers that year. That's interesting to those of us who are uh, managers that uh, we've had a center in Boyle Heights, Forth and Boyle, for close to those hundred years uh, that we own. And, and that has really been the home of where all of our, uh, our efforts had begun and, and were perpetuated. In 1941, uh, we held meetings with leading citizens. We didn't necessarily organize them or lead them, but we participated in them, other organizations and governments in an attempt to prevent the e evacuation of Japanese Americans. Again, not necessarily sticking to what's the most comfortable or the most safe, but ho what we thought was the most correct thing to do. Um, not a particularly popular position, but one that we were proud to do. In 1944, we supported the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. I don't know how much you know about the history of U.S. immigration law, but there were laws on the books that literally said uh, the Chinese immigrant faced much, much steeper uh, barriers to immigrating to the United States and others for, for reasons that were not particularly clear, uh, especially today. And so we were involved in helping repeal that. Uh, during World War II, veterans brought their uh, spouses from abroad, and we helped them learn English and adopt uh, new new uh, skills that would help them in their, their time here. Um, 
in the 1940s and 50s, 50s probably, uh, the Displaced Person Act uh, allowed refugees from Hungary, Albania, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, East Germany, and other places uh, to come to the United States. And so we were busy helping them resettle and, uh, and make a new life for themselves. In 1956, the freedom fighters of the Hungarian Revolution were resettled in Los Angeles, and we were a part of that. Um, in 1962, we were involved in uh, some of the boat lifts and air lifts out of uh, Havana. And as you heard earlier, when we were swapping uh, war stories, uh, we, we were also later involved in the 1980s in responding to those folks who left from the Port of Mariel in, in uh, Cuba. In the 1980s, we resettled Ethiopians, Eritreans, and later large numbers of Armenians. In 1986, we responded to what was called the Immigration Reform and Control Act and uh, helped to uh, secure both temporary and long-term status for tens of thousands of people. Um, We've done a lot of work in advocacy coalitions, not usually the leader, but the, as we like to say, the, the hands as opposed to the head. Um, and, and we were also co-founders of what is called the LA Co uh, Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights. Um, I know my time is limited, so I will uh, be uncharacteristically brief. Um, the lessons that we think we learned that we drew from this is that uh, leaders are called to some kind of a special, uh, special standard. They are best measured by the extent to which that they can step outside the traditional and the comfortable and the familiar and take certain kind of risks based on what they think are the real emerging needs. Sometimes there's uh, lots of funding for that, and if you listen to ORRs, uh, story, you would think there's always been a lot of funding for refugees. That is uh, not true, but it is, it is more true today. Um, and that uh, leaders empower not only their clients, but their staff to make change happen. And they help their organizations really take on a new identity that says, what are these changing needs outside our walls? outside our mission statement, outside the, the handy and convenient funding, and to champion those interests. I feel very privileged to have been part of the work of International Institute all these years. Um, uh, someone mentioned earlier that two, two directors of the Office of Refugee Resettlement have come from the uh, International Institute. The story I used to tell was as long as uh, the first one, who's named Lavinia Limon, she keeps moving up in the world. There's always a career path for me in her wake. And so uh, uh, I took her job when she moved to Washington in the Clinton administration. Uh, I think of the work that we all do as a calling. I think it's quite different from the meaning uh, of the word uh, career or job. A calling really con connotes, I think, something uh, very powerful. It's something that motivates us in a very visceral way to do the work we do. You're going to hear similar uh, opinions and, and experiences and lessons learned from our presenters today. So I thank all of you for your time and for attending. And uh, I'll close my remarks. Thank you. I think I do have time for questions. Let me, let me answer in a way that I think I'm a little more competent to answer. Uh, the historical record and the recent 25 years leads to some uh, unavoidable conclusions. Uh, you know, there, were, there used to be signs hanging on lots of uh, doorways saying Irish need not apply. So part of the issue is 
a fear of the newcomer, which is essentially the definition of xenophobia, uh, because people feel insecure. And, and those insecurities are much heightened during periods of economic downturn. And so the historical record is clear that those kind of uh, xenophobic uh, tendencies get much worse during times of economic uh, downturn. Uh, having said that, I think there's also the inescapable fact that to the extent that an intending immigrant or refugee uh, is not an Anglo-American or an Anglo background, uh, they are going to have even more antipathy toward their coming here. Um, I think that's indisputable. Whether it's worse today, I would say in certain respects, uh, I think it is worse because there are very organized efforts now that weren't so obvious 25 years ago uh, that are anti-immigrant, frankly. Um, I also think that there are a lot more people who are organized in support of the needs of immigrants and refugees. And so it's a little difficult to kind of measure. Uh, I, I guess I'm hedging my bets. I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question, but I think that certain aspects are worse. And uh, certain aspects are probably uh, more manageable, if you will. Yeah. Yes, John. Uh, with all the uh, global humanitarian crisis appearing on the scene right now, how do you see your agency working with that or addressing that? Yeah, um, we do an awful lot of things. What I didn't do, and it was in my notes there, was to toot our horn about all the hundred programs we operate, uh, many of which have much less to do with immigrants and refugees than they do with other subpopulations like seniors or children in childcare, and those are big services of ours. Um, the plain fact is this. Uh, I came up through social services in an era that was highly different from the preceding 50 to 100 years. And what am I talking about? Uh, really, in the 1960s, there was a huge increase and in influx of government funds that simply wasn't there before. It was, when we talked about charities before, we meant charities. Uh, now we mean uh, that we are experts at identifying and securing government funds. So part of the answer to the question, John, is can we muster the resources uh, in an environment where the government may not be providing them? Uh, we have a large emphasis on working with undocumented immigrants who are not called refugees uh, under the Office of Refugee Resettlement definition. We, we enjoy uh, no government funding for that, and we can count on one hand the number of government uh, uh, funding opportunities for essentially the legal interests of immigrants over the last 15, 20 years. Um, so I think what I would say is let's start with the need. And the need is, I think, is, as you articulated, that there are, there's growing unrest around the world. There will probably be growing interest and demand for people coming to the United States. Um, and I think it'll have a twofold impact on us. One is we'll, we'll have to step up our advocacy work. Um, and we do that both through national coalitions and local coalitions. Uh, we almost never act alone in that because there's strength in those numbers. Um, but I think we'll have to step up our advocacy, particularly for policies and legislation that will be more welcoming and more supporting of, of intending immigrants. Um, once people have arrived here, uh, we have a pretty good apparatus at International Institute and through the whole human service uh, programs of, of the uh, area to help them overcome the barriers that they have and, 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 and reach the goals that they have. So that is, to me, of less urgent concern, uh, but it is certainly not uh, an adequate solution. It's, it's uh, better than, than some. So I guess, in summary, I would say, we, one, we have to do more changing of hearts and minds, in a sense, which I, I think, you know, the question was asked back here. Personally, I see that as a very hostile environment right now. I really do. Um, I think people are frightened. I think they're afraid for their own security. And they will uh, exercise their 
self-protection in ways that are destructive to other people that don't deserve it. So I think we need to change some hearts and minds, get some public awareness uh, enhanced, and then we'll be able to serve them in the put, uh, once they've uh, secured their status here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Very, very impressive. Um, very inspiring. Thank you. Our next presenter is Alex Morales, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Children's Bureau of Southern California, a nonprofit leader in the prevention and treatment of child abuse, mental health, family support, child development, and community building that has served Southern California since 1904. Another 100 year, 110 years for Children's Bureau. The agency's research and expertise has impacted children and families nationwide. The agency directly serves more than 28,000 children and families each year in a geographical area with high levels of immigrant families and children. Alex will tell us about the services provided by Children's Bureau and how these service programs are impacted by uh, time and change and possibly the uh, the influx of immigrant populations in our community. Alex? What I'm hoping to um, leave you with is a challenge for the new kind of leadership that I think is needed in our society and I hope I leave you with a, a challenge to ask the disruptive questions of yourself and your own organizations and the things that you are active, actively involved with. For me, the, I'm a social worker and I ride the bus from MacArthur Park to our organization which is Children's Bureau is just about um, a mile uh, north of here. And when you get on the bus, one of the things you, you're struck with is all the different diverse people who are on there from all the different circumstances. It's different than the first part of my journey, which is on the Metro Link, with, which costs um, a fortune for your monthly charge and all of those are more professional people heading into Los Angeles. But as I look to see always if there's a, a young child and um, start my interest in playing peekaboo with uh, the, the toddler that is being held by their mother there, um, I can't help but worry and wonder the same kind of things that probably you do is you know, what's going to happen to, to that child. And the outcomes that now we are more aware of that can happen call for the disruptive question, well, what can be done about the large volumes of children and families at risk? So, well, I'm smiling at that child and playing my game and figuring out uh, how to hold their attention and eventually taking my cell phone out and seeing if I can attract that. Is she going to be the one in three who are going to be obese and at risk of diabetes and at risk of being maybe the first generation that will not live as long as her parents because of diabetes? Or will she, in this county, um, be one of the 3,000 child abuse reports that are made every week in Los Angeles County. Or almost worse yet, will she be one of the one in two who won't graduate from high school in these neighborhoods, putting her at risk and of homelessness and poverty and jail. Our organization, Children's Bureau, has been around 
for more than a century. But in, uh, it's now been a little over a dozen years ago, we started our strategic planning again, as we periodically do, and we first started, well, what is it that we can do? And we asked ourselves, well, what is the problems that are surrounding us? And it really struck us, well, if we just got, had a little bit more money, what a small dent we can make in the scale of the problems that are surrounding us. And that forced us into a new type of thinking of what we could meaningfully do. There's a book that's been out not that long ago, I would say three, four years ago, called A New Synthesis for Public Administration. But I think it really reflects a challenge for the new kind of way of leading organizations. But it really says that um, the old school of thought that we can form strategic plans and anticipate the future and move forward with our plans is really not real given the, given the speed at which the world changes so dramatically. And our strategic planning efforts came right at 9-11 in 2001 and recognizing just how quick the world suddenly turns. And what this is talking about in this new kind of leadership is that instead of focusing just on what you do, how can you focus at capacity building so that you can increase and broaden the ownership of institutions and organizations for a cause versus just what you're going to do yourself or your organization. We have government entities that are particularly responsible, say, for the protection of children in this county called the Department of Children and Family Services. But unless that institution and similar institutions, whether or not they're in the field of education or child care or health care, unless they can broaden to say the welfare of children and families is the ownership responsibility of everyone in society, we will never be able to tackle the problems at the scale that they need. Yes, we have lived through the Great Recession, but this next generation is going to really experience limited support from government and the philanthropic community. It's going to take a new kind of thinking, how will you get to the scale to address the problems that we have? The kind of capacity building that's called for in a response also calls for a different kind of leadership than the typical command and control and power kind of leadership that typically goes on in organizations. It requires a different kind of use of data and information that we typically associate with what we call the gold standard of evidence-based practices, but that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about the new use of data. The new use of data applies to me, who suffered from high blood pressure for over 40 years, and every time I go to the doctor's office for a cold or whatever it is, they routinely take my blood pressure. But they never tell me what it is. I always have to ask, well, well what was it? Because I know that's significant to me trying to control my medications and my own health. Using data and information not to pr produce whether or not something works, but to empower and engage and build capacity is part of the new kind of leadership strategies that we need. Trying to focus on a demanding question of how will you get to scale. One thing we're concerned in our organization is parents 
need to read more to their young children. And there are strategies that are out there how you can do this. You can do this in child development centers. You can do this by paying professionals to go into homes one, two times a week, taking books, helping the family learn how to, to read. But when you start to say, but the scale of the problem, there are 10,000 children under the age of five in the targeted area that we have selected that we want to make a dramatic difference applying a new kind of thinking. Then you start to think, well, money is not going to solve this problem. And then when you start appreciating the complexity of which people's problems exist, that it's not the typical siloed effect of somebody need housing or someone needs education, but you start seeing the interconnectedness of four major pillars that relate to someone's economic stability, their health, their education success, and the quality of the parenting going on in the home, you start to realize that your organization can't solve that problem. So the need to create a collaborative, which we've known about for now about 15 years, most organizations, if they're successful, already are part of networks. But those networks still haven't moved to the next level of the kind of generation of the new kind of strategy that you need. Typically, those networks are service networks led by a lead organization that subcontracts to its subcontractors to get them to perform. When the money shrinks, the network disappears and the services stop. And the services are the same traditional ways that we in society tend to solve problems, which is well after the fact when problems have really deepened, already rooted, and it is almost impossible to salvage those situations without tremendous scarring and there's tremendous limitations on the efficiency of being able to do that. And most people would say traditionally, well, you just need large holistic collaboratives that will be evidence-based in how they will provide their services. And I say that still doesn't represent the new kinds of thinking because most of the evidence-based strategies have been designing models to improve the old way of doing things. What we're involved in with Children's Bureau, and it decided that if it was really going to help build capacity, it shouldn't be a leader, it should be a spark. And we have chosen to be a spark to the formation of a voluntary collaborative effort now involving 75 organizations of which Children's Bureau was the spark and actively remains as part of this network of organizations that's rich in terms of the participation of the faith community, the government sector, the nonprofit sector, and business working together to say, what can we do for the dozen neighborhoods between USC and Pico Union? That's basically this area here, composed of 100,000 people and 35,000 children, and we want to see their health and their education and the quality of the parenting and stability for poverty so that these families are not living on the edge um, we want to address that. And we're doing it in a voluntary way because, as Steve said, it's a calling. If you only come to the table because a foundation has put a huge sum of money and invites people to the table and said, can we figure out how to work together? And you know what's going to happen at that table. Who's going to be the lead? How much do I get? Why are they here? And anyone says, should we include anybody else? No, 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 we're okay. You know, see. That method is not going to solve our strategies. A voluntary network which remains from the deepest commitment of organizations, be they the government sector or the nonprofit, is what needs to be nurtured. So how can you create this collaborative, build this system, and have it be a learning entity because 
It doesn't know yet the answers. It has to learn its way forward. And then how do you actually harness the power of the family itself that is actually living in the community who has the deepest commitment that we're over 30% up to 40% are undocumented and came to this country for a better life in the first place. How can you harness that energy and go beyond how can you help this family help their own family, but how can you help this family help another family? How do you generate that? You don't do it by paying parents to help other parents. You don't do it by paying them to pick up litter. Because when you stop paying them, when you take the internal pride of people wanting to work and make things different and turn it into an externalized reward system that comes just with money, then um, you, you, you totally reduce the, the strength of the motivation that needs to happen. So these organizations are trying to work together in a new kind of way as a learning network, taking the knowledge and information that comes from data that is collected in the schools and in the community and giving that back to the residents in the community. We are trying to recruit what we call neighborhood block ambassadors on every block. We have about 70, we need 500. So obviously we have a long ways to go, but they're out there working at recruiting more. We're trying to help this, there, there's an amazing center called uh, Magnolia Place. And that's where Children's Bureau said, can we help contribute by creating a hub that could support this? But this is more than just a family center that is a very progressive setting, of course, but it's what goes on outside the center that's going to make the difference by each of those neighborhood block people being the first contact to the other residents in the community that will help people. As we, we heard earlier, the secret of the community garden was healthy food. But the real secret of the community garden was the social connectedness that was coming from the families. So building on these things that we now have a framework for thinking of them as protective factors that help protect the well-being and health of a family, one being social connectedness. But these are things that we're trying to, as organizations and using the volunteer parents, pour into the community to strengthen the protective factors so that as many people can be helped early on and be as strong as possible, and then there will always be the need for deeper service support for families that from time to time need to hold on to a handrail to, to, to be helped. But by starting at the back end, and when people say, what's wrong with education? Well, I think it has something to do with the problem of the teachers' unions. I think we need to do more testing in the schools. I think we need to teach, keep teachers and pay them more so they don't uh, leave the profession. And I say, well, if by the time children are age three, they're already a half a year behind, the school public school system is always paying this game of catch up that it will never make. And the same problem goes for we're all excited about the fact that there's health care provided in our society. But that's a long ways from what will make the difference in your life is not your health care. It will be, what do you eat? Do you exercise? Do you smoke? What kind of environment are you living in that will contribute to your health? So the emphasis on wellness is missing from our solution. So the same model for what we do related to education, failing to address what needs to be done in health, not health care, but wellness, the same kind of um, uh, mistake that, that we we deal with the, for the protection of children in uh, the, the problem of child abuse. Do you know there's $2 billion spent by that government entity, the Department of Children and Family Services, related to child abuse and dealing with that. But less than $50 million 
out of the two billion is invested before there's a report of child abuse. So with 3,000 reports coming in every day and putting in two billion in there, and we know that there's so much more going on that's not dealing and dealing after the fact. So again, the need for the disruptive question that will guide us to new kinds of solutions is what needs to take place by each of us in the organizations and the influence that we can, can pass on in the networks and, and public policy settings that we're involved in. If you think about it, and I'm a believer in it, that almost anything can be solved if ego doesn't get in the way. Ego, it, what is blocking our partisan politics, is blocking organizations, is blocking networks, is blocking the way funders fund. We must be the kind of leaders that are focused on capacity building more than our own ego of ourselves or our institutions. I um, want to applaud Steve's uh, last comment about what his leadership moved to, to a calling. And I'm close to that. And that's the kind that moves you away from the ego-centered approach. It was a job. It was a career. It became a mission. For me, it's now a ministry. But find the deepest part of your soul to move you off ego to making the difference that our society needs that will allow the network that you're trying to build to succeed. If I say we'd like Children's Bureau and Alex Morales would like to lead a coalition of 75 organizations, who's going to join that? Well, it looks like, Alex, you're going to get all the credit. Looks like Children's Bureau is going to get all the credit. It doesn't work when you try to convene in that kind of way. But when you recognize there's a concept that, that, that's talked about out there where we want to have collective impact strategies, the idea of bringing organizations together to share data, share mission, share working together. But there's kind of a little debate. How, how are you going to lead these things? Oh, uh, some, there needs to be a backbone. Well, that backbone starts to get to the problem of ego. And then so, uh, you need a captain. And then I go, that sounds a lot like ego problems. That sounds a lot like football. And when you think of football, football is played, you, you have this burst of energy where the play is made. Then they pause. They come back together again. Then somebody calls in a play from the outside. It goes to the quarterback who directs the play with the other players. But you say, we're not playing football. We're playing soccer. When you play soccer, it's real time ac action that goes on by every player interacting with the ball and paying attention not just to the ball, but all the space around them and acting in that way versus, I want the ball and I will direct the play, it's moving too quickly in that way. And that's the kind of new leadership, that's the kind of transformation we need, and what Children's Bureau has said to itself, we can't address the scale of the problem that exists today. And we want to be able to not just help a child, not just help the family, but say, is it possible to actually transform an entire community neighborhood? So we've picked our dozen. Children's Bureau is located in almost 20 different communities in Los Angeles and Orange County, but we picked this one for this grand experiment, laboratory of coming together, trying to build a model that we hope others in the country will learn some of what we're learning, don't do some of the mistakes we're doing and take it and make your own commitment 
and try to make that happen in your neighborhood. We call the work that we're doing by getting our neighborhood ambassadors our belong movement because we think belong is the deepest sense of what people want. They want to fit in, they want to belong, and they're willing to work to create a community where they can belong. We hope other communities will try to create a community where they want to belong. We're, we're pleased that um, Taiwan and Canada and England and Australia have come over to take a look. Uh, we're pleased that other counties and states are coming over to see what we have. Um, we've been lifted up as an effort of promising effort by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others. But we're not there. We're a long ways. We're, we're, we're on first base trying to go, go to others uh, and, and be able to get to the destination of building the kind of evidence you need of the impact. But I think that to, to focus on the building of the system of community, of organizations, is the most important way to start versus just starting with an outcome. So I'll stop with that, invite any questions or comments, and uh, then we'll have our break. I think it takes, yeah, how, 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 do you, how do you go about creating this ego, uh, ego-less in, in an organization and in yourself? Um, I think it takes uh, leaders who, who, you're in it because you want to make a difference, but your ego can get in the way, but by your self-awareness of this, allows you to start curbing and paying attention to that, but also with the donors and board members of our organization, we had to do that too. Because the board members and donors said, well, we, we just put, put $22 million donating money for this wonderful center that, 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 that has all these things. We want to, this to be our network. We want to say, no, it, first of all, it isn't. And if we try to say it is, you spoil the whole thing. And helping people become aware of those dynamics and people can return to their greater good feeling that is making them serve. But their tendency will be to put your name on it and brand it and, and do that. And it, it's a self-awareness and fortunately many of us uh, are able to draw upon a deeper commitment that either our government entity that we're part of was founded on and established for, or our nonprofits were, or the faith community was committed to. It, it is um, paradoxical, and I don't quite know what to, to fully say. Um, we, we need money, but money can also be the, the biggest threat to the success of the project. So, and that's where um, foundations haven't always figured out how do I use money wisely without it disrupting the kind of building that this has? What helped us in a paradoxical way was we had no money. So Children's Bureau went around to some organizations and said, we don't have any money. 
but we are committed trying to do this. We don't know anything about health care. We don't know anything about job training. Uh, we don't know anything about housing, but you do. Here are the things that, that moved us about the plight of the community. We can try to bring our resources to bear. And can you work to align together your resources, doing the same thing, but work to align it? And for instance, um, there's an organization called the Children's Nature Institute. And they try to help children learn about um, environmental concerns and, and uh, appreciating the, the, the nature in an urban setting. And they said, but, but what is the network trying to do? Well, we're trying to help families strengthen these protective factors. And one is social connection. And they said, well, we take the children on community walks with a volunteer to help explore. If there's litter on the street, they learn. It goes into the sewer, it goes to the oceans. They look at the bark of the tree and say, but we can have their parents come with them when we do it. And we can try to get the parents to introduce themselves and get to know each other when we go on the community walk. So they're not spending a penny more. Children's Bureau has a Thanksgiving party. We, we try to give out some free turkeys and serve a meal to families in the community, a couple of hundred of them. But then we start to say, but wait a minute, we're, we're trying to work on social connection. What if we arrange the seating and ask people to sit by the block that they live in so they actually get to enjoy a meal and get to know who else is on their block by doing it. We don't pay a penny more. We just do it with the intentionality. So asking organizations, bring what you have. We don't have more money to give you, but bring it and align it along the theory of change that we're using here. And we will all have a greater impact on the families we serve. And yes, when you go to apply for funding, as you tell people you are part of something greater, um, then that may strengthen the appeal of someone to support you because they get multiple levels of exponential benefit from not just helping you, but now your child and family that you're helping is enriched by 74 other organizations that are helping them. So yes, it, it may have an advantage that way, but money wasn't the first, say, you know, invitation. But again, that, that that's uh, paradoxical because without resources, how do you do? Children's Bureau's raising resources. We have, we have those dinner parties that you are trying to have so we can help pay so this network has some core staff to support it. So we raise money and our board said, well, why are we paying for something we don't own? I said, because we wanted to make this greater impact that and there was no way we can do it by ourselves because the issues are too complex. So our donations help this happen. If we can get other people to donate, it helps it happen. One more, one more question. Hi. Um, I happen to be doing National Student Care with John Morton. Yes. And he talks about, and I know this place all the time, I show up on your Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think what, what's driving it is the recognition that the solutions we have today, that basically most institutions, government, and so forth aren't practicing, are not going to get to the scale of the problem. And especially if you're concerned about the undocumented who won't be eligible for many things, even more so. So it's a recognition we need a new way. But what is that answer? We have a theory of change yet to be proven. So you can say, you know, people say, why should, why should we give money to this new exploration effort? And, and I say, you know, and, and so we'll, we'll give money when, when uh, you prove it works. 
and you know, I kind of say, okay, but you think you're giving money over here to this system where the kids aren't going to make it in public schools and we'll just have a few more tutors for them? You think that's going to do it? And yes, we need services to address gang problems, but that's not going to do it. So it's, it's so f fascinating to me that they want proof of the new way when there's tremendous proof the old way doesn't work. You know, but, but, uh, but I can't get DCFS to give up on the $2 billion and put a little more on prevention. No, we're going to keep doing, we're going to keep doing what we do. Um, so it, the long term comes from a recognition. We don't have the answer, but, we, but our old way doesn't work. We need to find a new way other than just keep hoping someone will send a rescue boat out to the Titanic and get a few people. You know, that, that's not going to work. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Alex. Wonderful, wonderful. So it, it jiggles all the gray cells in my brain. <laughs> I have to think about all this. We're going to take a break. Um, we will uh, resume right at uh, 11 for our next three presenters. And um, so although we're getting a little bit of a late start, I'd like to take the full hour. And I share that with you so that you don't get uh, that you don't anticipate that we'll break for lunch at the time on the agenda. We'll break for lunch one hour from now to give everybody an opportunity to share uh, the wonderful programs that they're working with. So our, um, our second panel this morning is going to focus more on existing resources that are available in our communities that serve uh, immigrant families and children or are providing resources to nonprofit agencies offering services to migrant children and families. So uh, first, we're going to hear from uh, Cecilia Seiko. Cecilia is the supervising children's social worker for the Special Immigration Immigrant Status Unit in uh, Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services. This program, which was instituted in the uh, 70s and 80s by Los Angeles County has been providing legalization services to undocumented children who are victims of abuse and neglect and advocating on their behalf. C Cecilia will share with us information about the DCFS unit as well as any impact that this service may be experiencing with the recent increase in unaccompanied children entering the country. Cecilia. Good morning. Thank you. Again, my name is Cecilia Sacco. I work for the Department of Children and Family Services. I'm a supervisor. I supervise a specialized program called the Special Immigrant Status Unit. This unit has gone through a lot of changes since um, the Department of Children and Family Services uh, started at its own department in, back in 1986. Prior to that, there were also some form of a unit with a different name uh, under the supervision of um, other uh, people in the in the county. But I but I wanted to I wanted to say that this unit as as you know it now, wouldn't exist be, if one of the most inspirational leaders to me that is present here today in, in this room, uh, Carlos Sosa, who has been a, a, a professor at USC as well as the, in the Cal State system, wouldn't have this vision. Um, uh, he wouldn't just stop and doing nothing when we when we were struggling with uh, providing services to immigrant children and families, when there were no services at all, um, and the department took that initiative to put together a group of professionals that were addressing all these problems and that were advocating for policy, that were um, ad trying to develop relationships with um, other other countries like Mexico, for example, the majority of children who crossed the borders and, and came to uh, Los Angeles County were coming from Mexico. And sometimes social workers just took the children to the border and give it to whoever claimed to be a relative. Um, 
we know that human trafficking exists, that there's um, illegal adoptions going on from uh, across the borders, and we really were not putting a lot of attention to, to these issues. And we just, you know, returning children to anyone who claims to, to, to have a relationship with that child. What um, Carlos Sosa and other leaders like Esther Gilles, who also was one of the leaders at um, TCFS at the time, did is that they started developing relationships with DIF in Mexico, which is a, a sister agency that provides social services to, to families in Mexico, and with other countries where, um, where we could explore the possibility of reunifying children with relatives when that was a possibility, and that's, that's how the unit st started. In 1991, in 1990, there was an immigration law that was passed, and it's called the Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. And this law um, became the focus of the unit as you know it today. A special Immigrant Juvenile Status is a federal law under which a child who has been a victim of abuse, neglect, or abandonment has the unique opportunity when they become dependents of a juvenile court to apply for legal status. If the, especially if they are not going to reunify with their parents or if they are going to reunify with one parent only. If that child emancipates from a dependency system or from any juvenile court, the possibilities of that child become successful citizen of the United States are, are minimal if this child doesn't have the legal status to work legally, to, to to also go to um, uh, higher education. But especially in grand juvenile status allows children to, to do that. And, and the unit that I supervise now has been doing that since 1991. Um, we provide about, um, we legalize about 160 children per year, we apply from the beginning to the end until the child obtains a green card. And it's based on the fact that the child is a dependent of the court, the child has been abused, neglected, or abandoned, the child doesn't have parents or has one parent and doesn't have uh, the other parent to provide uh, for the basic necessities of life. Immigration requires that we maintain jurisdiction during the whole process. What is unique about this law is that the child can be a legal permanent resident in about six months. And um, the, there's some provisions though that don't allow the family to benefit from this law. So if the child becomes 21 and they can apply for legal status for the parents, the law doesn't permit that. The reason for that is because the law, the law was passed exclusively so children can be protected from abusive parents. So the law doesn't benefit the parents if, if the children are able to obtain legal status or even citizenship later on. When we um, have been filing for um, a special immigrant juvenile status, we have to read the family history, we have to be familiar with uh, the issues that the family have. Um, um, Prior to um, a few years ago, we were not doing other than applying for a special immigrant juvenile status on behalf of undocumented children who came in to the attention of DCFS. But then we started reading that some of the families were victims of domestic violence, that some we have um, cases of human trafficking, that there were other issues uh, that the families were involved with, and many of them were victims of all these crimes. And then we uh, started identifying these families as well and refer them out to community uh, partners who do process uh, U visas, um, trafficking visas, um, asylum cases. And we have been doing that. Um, the department in 2008 also became part of the U visa certification process. 
um, I have been designated to do U visa certifications for the department. So the U visa certification is part of the application process for a U visa. U visas also are um, visas that were granted by the federal government with the idea to, in, to, to make victims um, come forward with information about the abusers. Many times, uh, immigrant, uh, immigrant uh, families, immigrant women were victims of, of uh, severe uh, domestic violence, for example, but they were afraid to report the abusers, the perpetrators, in fear that they were exposing themselves to uh, the police and, and revealing that, that they are undocumented. The, um, the, the idea of issuing U visas, and we start doing the U visa since 2007, uh, is that a victim can come forward and at the same time has the opportunity to become a legal resident if they provide information about the abuser. So the abuser could be prosecuted, and, and in the cases that are undocumented, also um, uh, deported. So, so we have been doing the U visa certification, which is a, a verification that the, the victim has been uh, cooperative with law enforcement and DCFS in the um, investigation and prosecution of the crime. And we also have been active in identifying victims of human trafficking. There has been um, uh, an increase in the, in the number of cases that we see children being brought from rural uh, villages from Guatemala, for example, or recruited with the promise that they will come here to to work in restaurants and beauty salons, and and then when they come here, the children are uh, forced into prostitution. There has been a, a tremendous increase of these cases um, because it seems like it's more prod it, it brings more profit to some people to smuggle people instead of smuggling drugs, for example, and and the prostitution by children has taken uh, to extreme numbers in, in recent years, which is sad, you know, but um, we have made a, a tremendous effort to identify these children that sometimes end up in our system as victims of human trafficking, so they can also qualify for uh, relief. The department also, um, has taken an active role in um, making provisions now that we have the tremendous influx of unaccompanied children coming to the United States. Even though these children do not come directly to the attention of the Department of Children and Family Services, we have to be aware of that potentially they could uh, come as client of uh, DCFS. When a child comes and company without a guardian and enters the country illegally and they are caught by the immigration service, they go into a detention center, but at the federal level. They are uh, under the Office of Refugee Resettlement who uh, places the children, provides services, uh, look for a sponsor, and release these children to sponsors. When a sponsor abuses a child, and there's no longer jurisdiction from the federal government, that child potentially can become uh, a client of DCFS. And we have to be prepared with understanding the issues that they uh, bring with them, understanding their, um, that they're flying, they're, they're fleeing from abuse, from violence, from gangs, from, um, uh, abusive families, and we have to to be able to provide also similar services that we provide to other uh, children that uh, we serve in Los Angeles County. Um, at, at the unit, we have seen about eight children that were re-detained from um, uh, 
um, from a sponsor since, uh, since all these uh, thousands of children have been released in LA County. So that means that the impact that we have had really hasn't been great. But um, we still have to be vigilant of uh, the possible um, uh, influx of more children into our system. The Special Immigrant Status Unit um, uh, has uh, seven people. Uh, we provide services to uh, not only undocumented children, undocumented families. We uh, continue to expand. We are um, probably going to include more services to undocumented families as, as, as the uh, need is identified. We, um, we really want you to, th to, to understand that, that the abuse, neglect, or abandonment that these children experience is such, is such um, a great force to, to push our unit to, to go beyond the services that we provide right now and, and always looking for um, ways to improve the lives of this population. And we have seen uh, tremendous um, uh, success in some of the children that we have legalized been really um, successful in going to college and uh, applying uh, for services that are so difficult to obtain, even for children who are born here. Um, so see a tremendous resilience on the children that we have helped and seeing that they will become uh, legal residents and US citizens and, and citizens of this country make a tremendous um, uh, impact in, in our unit and the services that we continue to provide. I'm, I'm going to stop, so see if, I, if you have any questions about the unit. Yes. Okay, um, you, you want to know why um, I, I only mentioned that I have seen eight unaccompanied children coming to, to the, from June, I forgot to mention from June on um, until uh, October. We have seen uh, only eight children who were released after being unaccompanied, who were released to a sponsor. And I have seen only eight children being abused by, by that sponsor and then becoming part of our system. Only when a child is abused in LA County and uh, the call comes through our hotline that that child can become, uh, if we are able to sustain the abuse, that child can come to the attention of DCFS. So those are the cases that I'm mentioning. Usually, um, 
the social worker um, in charge of the case doesn't really provide uh, this kind of guidance. The, the services are provided by this unit that I supervise, so I highly encourage you to let me know what um, services these children need, and I'll be happy to explore how we can uh, serve those children. Okay. Any other question? Yes. How do you take care of the education needs of all these children? How do you manage that with your work? Um, all the children that come to the attention of DCFS go to local schools. Um, as I mentioned, we haven't had really an impact with the unaccompanied children because we are local um, child protective agency. We work only with the uh, county and uh, the children are under federal custody. So the, if you're talking about the 60,000 children that have been uh, detained and, and they're in, uh, in uh, different um, shelters or in different uh, placements, those children are usually, um, they get their education resources either at, um, at the, the placement where they are or they, local, they go to local schools. So your case work, I mean your case is how do you handle the education needs for them? Well, many of these children have the limitation of the language. Uh, many have them, many of them have not had really formal education. Um, some of them have never been to school. Um, so we just have to rely on the resources that the um, uh, Los Angeles School District has in regards to providing bilingual education, tutoring, and some other resources. The same services that any other child receives in LA will be the same for the undocumented children. Okay, the question is how to identify the children that may need uh, services, right? No, no. With the legal department, you mentioned that you assist children uh, find some immigration relief. Some children may not have the eligible for uh, special juvenile visas, yeah. the visa. Exactly. We, we don't work with any um, um, uh, legal uh, department in any of the community um, providers. We provide, we actually do the filing ourselves. We, uh, from the beginning to the end, we interview the children, we complete the applications, we take the children to, to their medical exams, we take them to their biometric appointments, we go with them to the immigration service, we file all the cases with the Chicago Lock, Lock Center. Uh, we manage all the appointments for them, and uh, we guide them through from the beginning to the end until they obtain the, a green card. The only time that we get an attorney involved uh, on pro bono basis to represent the children is when the child has been put in removal proceedings, like for example, an accompanied child who has an immigration case with uh, immigration court will need um, an attorney to, to file for the cancellation of the removal order. And that's the only time that we depend on uh, community partners to do pro bono representation for these children. But I'm talking about 10 to 12 cases per year and in those cases. The 160 cases that I mentioned that we um, legalize, we legalize ourselves. We don't we then um, involve attorneys in the process. That's a good help. We're going to take this Of course. Oh, no problem. <laughs> One last question. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much, you. Celia. <laughs> thank you so much, Cecilia. Great information and a great, great work that you're involved in. 
And I did want to mention, Cecilia was uh, anxious about Carlos Sosa being present because he <laughs> was the one who instituted this concept and developed it in the early days. And uh, rather than having Carlos present today, I can just refer you to YouTube, USC School of Social Work, Carlos and Al Gladys Brito, who were the uh, implementers of this program in the 1970s, have an hour video on YouTube, so you can go see Carlos there. Our next presenter is uh, Steve Reyes, um, who recently joined the California Community Foundation as the senior advisor for the Unaccompanied Minors Initiative advising uh, the foundation and its philanthropic partners on a response to address the needs of unaccompanied children crossing the borders following the surge in the last several months. Um, and with that, I think I have more to say about Steve, but I'll let him say it himself and um, share with you what he and the foundation are doing. Steve? So thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Maria Blanco was uh, who uh, was originally scheduled to make some remarks, and then she, like everybody else, is dropping like flies. I'm just trying to get over something myself, so hopefully I'll last long enough for this uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, uh, so I joined uh, very recently. Joined the California Community Foundation. Um, I was formerly a. a um, health deputy, mental health deputy for uh, Supervisor Molina's office. Um, and prior to that, I've served as an attorney working with various uh, entities through MALDEF and, and a private law firm doing political law of all things, election law. Um, and, and so I, I was uh, asked to come on board as, you know, the, the, the news started spreading and the newspaper articles started appearing, the Marietta News was predominating the news. Um, uh, because the California Community Foundation was interested in, and they knew they had to provide some sort of response, and so did many of the the, the philanthropic partners uh, provide some. Uh, they they wanted also to figure out how they could help, um, even if it was just a little bit. Uh, and so they asked uh, the California Community Foundation to provide some assistance in in determining what that response should be. And, and one of the things, you know, that, that the, the foundation did was immediately set up a fund, got some monies in, into, the, uh, in, into this fund to help provide some immediate relief for some of the organizations who are really were seeing the, the brunt of, of this surge. So some of the legal service providers who needed more caseworkers, more attorneys, you know, more social work type case managers to help deal with the, these these kids, and and so that's been going on, um, uh, but I want to kind of back up a little bit and share with you, um, if you haven't already heard, some of what's been happening recently over the past few months um, with the, the unaccompanied minor crisis. Um, so as you, you know uh, from the newspaper articles, California's, because of the, the huge Central American immigrant population here in LA County has been a, a top destination point for these children, you know, among the top, even if you considered LA County a state, we'd probably rank up there about eighth or, or, or so. So nationally, one in 20 kids that is released from the um, Office of Refugee Resettlement um, uh, finds their way to a sponsor and is placed with a sponsor here in LA County. And out of, um, since the beginning of January to August 31st, um, 2,300 kids, children, have been placed here in the county with sponsors. And that's about half, just about half of uh, all the numbers statewide, so about 4,600 statewide. And, and, um, and uh, Ron had mentioned earlier in his presentation that the numbers have dipped um, somewhat, uh, and, and, and especially when you compare it to June. And most of the commentators and, and observers are thinking that this number is going to rise again as the summer months uh, cool and the weather cools and that we're going to start seeing this resurgence of kids. In fact, one uh, a recent paper I just came across focused on tracking the number of children apprehended from you know the past uh, decade or so or longer and tracked it with the uptick in the economy. And so as you've probably been hearing recently, we've been hearing of some better news uh, uh, on the economic front. And they, you know, some of his research has, seems to uh, suggest a parallel with that. Um, in addition to all the uh, political upheaval and, and violence that they're facing, 
um, <coughs> economic push factors may be providing some of the explanation, not all of the explanation, certainly. Um, and nationally, we've seen <coughs> a huge spectrum of a response across the country that can provide probably some models here, here locally. Um, we've seen church parishes in Texas and agencies c coming together, providing you know, some basic necessities for kids as they make their way from bus stops to, to their point of destination when mothers and, and, and children are apprehended, for example. Nationally, we've seen some of some recent funding initiatives coming from the, the government for um, post-release services. So some of the case management services that um, uh, limited, time-limited case management services for some of those kids who have some identified mental health needs or health needs. They're, they're tracked for limited time. They're provided services after their release. Um, attorney, there's been some uh, $9 million allocated to eight cities, to providers to provide additional legal representation. In the state, something similar is kind of in, in the works with $3 million being allocated across the state to, to, um, to provide uh, assistance to nonprofit organizations who are helping these, these kids uh, have, uh, get lawyers and representation. And New York City has, you know, had an interesting, very interesting program and an effective program in helping uh, provide uh, assistance to um, um, some of the proceedings these kids are involved in. Um, San Francisco, you know, bring the, their board of supervisors has provided increased, you know, some funding for legal services, which is fantastic. Sonoma County is allowing, for example, their attorneys in, in their, their offices to to um, volunteer pro their pro bono time on ca county time to provide assistance to these kids. Um, locally, we see LA City uh, providing, helping to coordinate some of the relief efforts. The city of Bell wants to help, uh, you, you, in the news a few months ago, host some, some shelters. And um, LA County departments are trying to figure out where they can make their impact. And it's not completely clear yet because of the nature of how this, this issue is unfolding. Um, and so what, um, as I mentioned earlier, s the philanthropic community here have come together through CCF and, and to provide to uh, help provide a response. Um, they hired me recently to help look at what the lay of the land is, where some of these conduct the basic needs assessment, um, and figure out where we can make a difference and an impact. Um, one of the, the uh, we want to make sure that that um, certainly there's a broad need, and uh, as Alex was saying, there's you know, government solution alone, philanthropic monies alone aren't going to solve this issue. Um, and 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 while there may be a finite and small piece that we can help with, it's not going to address the really varying needs. Um, and I'll talk a few uh, about some of them right now that these children have as they as they try and adjust to to life here. Um, so some of the things I've been looking at, uh, in addition, we know that they have a, a, a need for legal representation, and, and if, if these kids are left without attorneys, they're, going, they're likely going to be deported back to their, there's going to be order of deportation issued, and they're going to be by themselves in the same situations that they um, uh, fled. Um, and so there's been a real push to try and get these kids to have some representation that might ha uh, allow them to have access to some of the other services they'll need uh, here. So mental health, um, you've all probably seen the stories in the Times and across the country of some of the, the very horrific situations these kids have endured um, and, and uh, you know, both in their countries and then on aboard the train. Um, rape, murder, uh, robbery, and, and then when they get here, there's issues with uh, reconciliation uh, with their, their parents, some of whom they have not seen in, in a decade. Uh, and, and so there's issues, you know, uh, between the child and the mother or the father, uh, feelings of abandonment on one side and lack of gratitude on the other side. And you know that can lead uh, uh, in a spiral downwards, you know, and get these kids involved in things that they don't need to be at this at this point. Um, and and so I've been looking also on that note on what types of services different organizations, different nonprofits are providing to help normalize these kids' situations. Aside from some of the mental health services that that they, are, they that many of these kids need, but uh, you know. 
Are there mentoring programs after school? Are there after school sports programs? Are there gang prevention programs? Um, you know, family, you know, uh, reunification and group sessions that can be uh, effective. And some I've found have already been doing this work. Like many of these organizations I've been talking to, both on the health and mental front, they've already hit the ground running. They're trying to figure out right now how they can all work together as part of a network to ensure that they're maximizing their own effectiveness and they're not, they're talking to each other and they know where these kids are. Case management is also going to be an issue in, in making sure they, they can track that kid, uh, that child, um, and refer them to the right places depending on where they live. Um, one of the things I've done was because we're not getting a lot of detailed data from the federal government as to where these kids are placed, we have to find some proxies. So I've been talking to the, 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 or the service providers, the direct service providers, to see where, where are the zip codes, at least, where these kids are living. Uh, census data can tell us another little piece of this by looking at where the immigrant community uh, from uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador live in this county. And there are, you know, the traditional places, Pico Union, obviously, the, the kind of uh, uh, central location. Then we have, it goes down along the 110 freeway towards Downey and Paramount and, and, and further west. But then you have a huge pocket of, of immigrant families and communities north of the 134, which, you know, not, I don't travel that way much, don't, never would have occurred to me as, 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 as quickly as a lot of the folks who provide services. So from, from North Hollywood up towards Pacoima and San Fernando towards uh, Canoga Park. And, and what I've done was trying to locate what, who the providers are, who are the mental health providers in those areas, who are the other providers in those areas. Are they seeing any increase in the kids that they're uh, from this population? And you know, some of them may not know that they are seeing, but they're seeing an increase. And uh, because a lot of these kids are not necessarily going to walk in the door and say, you know, I just got off uh, aboard this train, and I came from wherever. And so we're trying to create some awareness in, in, in these areas and regions with these providers so that they can start to recognize um, who might be part of, uh, of this group in need of services. And so in, in, as, we, as I move towards recommendations of, you know, what, where can uh, the foundation's money, the fund's money be effective, I'm looking at um, not only in the, the, the specific needs to ex expand some of the capacity, the ability to, to, to see these kids in, 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 in a limited budgetary kind of environment, but also, you know, beyond that, is there the administrative support, the core operating support that can help them sustain that increase in staff or, um, or programming that they're going to uh, likely be facing as these numbers increase again? Um, and so, p again, part of it has been to connect, being connecting folks to each other to make sure that the, you know, the, the clinics, you know, are, are talking to the right folks and that they have some of the data that I'm collecting and that they share their data. So I'm helping to become a repository so I can, uh, we can expand the reach and effectiveness of, of monies that are eventually allocated. Um, and so, you know, the, the the other few things I wanted to mention in terms of, of, of the foundation's role is, you know, and I've been wanting not to say, here's, here's where I think there is a, a definite uh, gap in services, whether it's case management and say, okay, we're going to fund a position. That position may not, type of, may not work for the, the, the folks who are on the ground and force them to alter their workflow, alter their, their um, um, ability to provide services in a way that's not going to be productive. So I'm looking at a lot of the solutions that are developing you know, amongst the organizations themselves, you know, providing connections with whether it's county government uh, resources and assistance, possible federal government resources and assistance to throw different types of things on that menu of possibilities. So um, the overall, I think this is, you know, um, I've been very fortunate to work with a, a great team over at the California Community Foundation, Maria Blanco, and, and uh, uh, Christine Kim here is also working on the issue with me. And the, the foundation's been involved in the space in, in, in working on its in, in immigrant integration initiatives on driver's license issues, on DACA, 
um, and and so there's there's a history of of, of of working with a lot of these organizations, some of which are in the room here, um, to address these often recurring issues. And we're going to likely see some more probably in the next few months as as we see what happens on the um, national front with any administrative um, relief, possible administrative relief. Um, but I'll open it up to questions if you have any. And if you don't, I'll sit down. Sure. Yeah, so uh, yes, we have met with uh, LAUSD, and they are looking at their own data, particularly gathered through their Office of Enrollment that's not too far from here. They see newcomers, new kids coming in from other countries all the time, every day. I was there last week, I think. There were a lot of folks coming in. And what they're looking to do is identify their schools, their top 20, perhaps, schools of kids where these ki uh, of, of schools where these kids are enrolling which is gonna help in terms of identifying what, what counseling resources are at those schools already, or what mental health or wellness centers run through the district are, are close by that can be connected to, making sure the, the, the counselors there, uh, if there are there, uh, or the administrators know that there's this cohort of kids, there's this group of children who may need a little bit more attention because of what they experienced. Um, and and uh, the, the county, uh, Department of Mental Health has a lot of school-based uh, centers throughout the county beyond LAUSD, which is another avenue for resources. So it's it's a lot of putting together and connecting dots um, and and resources that are really distributed throughout the um, throughout the county. That's it's a little bit of the challenge here. Sure. You, you mentioned that the feds are not giving you information about who's coming to LA County. Yeah. Well, we're getting basic information. We the the count the, some of the numbers that I just rattled off earlier were from HHS, the Health and Human Services. Their concerns are security. I think it's kind of a reaction to Marietta, I think, and not wanting there to be kind of flashpoints of of, of violence or, or 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 what we saw there with respect to kids. If they give us more refined data, like uh, you know, certainly we're not going to get block data, level data, or address level data, it certainly wouldn't want that, you know, because of its potential for misuse. But I think that's animating, and, and we've been pushing them, and I think part of the, instead of getting state data, we then recently, two months ago, got the county level data, which was, I think, progress. And hopefully we'll see a little bit more progress on that front. The trend in five years, wow. Um, if I can, I mentioned at the outset, if we're, we're tracking, if indeed this is tied to political upheaval, you know, some of the numbers coming over and, and perhaps economic, you know, uh, factors, you know, as the economy increases, we may see an increase. And that's what one of the authors out of UCLA of this study predicted. He says, we're going to see uh, a huge surge in the number of kids that kind of mirrored um, the numbers of kids coming earlier in the last decade. Um, and they didn't track them apparently as unaccompanied minors then, but they, they did track the number of kids, which was uh, you know, pretty high uh, in the early 2000s from what his report suggests. Um, I'm hoping that, that we can use this sort of lull, so to speak, in the numbers of kids coming over to, to, to quickly reorganize and organize amongst ourselves because if those numbers, you know, uh, persist, you know, and, and increase again, we're going to be in the same place. HHS is going to be in, you know, perhaps a little bit less of panic mode and setting up all those military base um, um, shelters, but it's going to be the same things again in, in, in this political environment. It's, it's not going to be the, the uh, it's not going to look good, I think. Go ahead. The last um, question. Oh. In my class, we need the information coordination. And we talked about um, USCCF being kind of the repository of 
Well, I think that'll evolve. Certainly right now, I'm trying to serve in that capacity for, for folks that I speak to, providing them what I know about what others are doing, what the data is suggesting, where these neighborhoods are. Um, and, and my position is temporary. I took a leave from county service to come and do this, and I'll be going back to county afterwards. And after that, you know, there's, there's folks within the foundation that will, I assume, take up that mantle and, and be a, a repository and, and a resource for folks. Certainly there's, there's leadership at the city, and they're providing, collecting information and resources as well that can help. And, and the, every, every meeting I see, I'm at, I see Linda Lopez from uh, uh, City of LA. So there's, there's a lot of uh, work being done there, and you know, that may evolve also in terms of you know, um, who's, who's actively collecting information and distributing out to folks. But uh, I'm sure it'll be evolving. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. A lot of information. Our final presenter for this panel is uh, Alex Morales. Ah, Alex Morales, you talked already. See, you confused me by sitting at the table. I can't keep track of people that don't follow the rules. <laughs> Alex Sanchez. Alex was correct. Alex is, uh, well, Alex, uh, my notes say you're an outspoken community leader with a commitment to disenfranchised youth and their families. In the Latino and largely Central American communities of the Pico Union, Westlake, and Koreatown areas of LA. And your journey is rooted in your own personal journey that includes having been a gang involved youth, a target of the INS, LAPD, and the Salvadoran National Police and Death Squads. So um, you and your family emigrated to the United States in the 1970s and uh, you will have many tales to tell us, I am sure. So with that, let me bring you to the podium. Alex. So we have a crisis. That's what it was called. And this is uh, just to uh, just to make sure that everybody knows, this is not something that's being new. I came here in 1979 after my parents had left me for over five years in El Salvador. I was three years old, my brother was a year and a half when they left us behind. And um, when they sent for us, we no longer knew our parents. We were calling somebody else parents. We were comfortable in the place where we didn't have shoes, only for school. But we have fruit trees in the backyard and a beautiful view of uh, a lake called Apulo and the, and the uh, volcanoes of San Vicente, a million dollar view. To come here, be exchanged in Skid Row with a couple that I no longer knew, that I had to call now mom and dad. And the difficulty of having to do that and to face this culture clash that I faced in regards to being called a wetback, go back to Mexico. And I was not Mexican, and still I'm not. <laughs> and having to face this bullying in school by other people that I thought that didn't want to speak Spanish because they felt they were cool and uh, they looked the same color of my skin, right? All these issues that I was confronted with, you know, I did not have answers for. Nobody came to me and addressed them. 
I was put in the back of the class just to stay quiet and don't make any noise. And it led me to find my own solutions. And in fourth grade, I did not be, want to be bullied anymore. And I lashed out on the kid that crumpled my paper airplane I was playing with. And that I, I let go of that anger I had. I let go of the fact that I was in this country, that I didn't want to be here, that I didn't want to smell the urine smell in the back alley where my home was, that I wanted, didn't want to be cut anymore by jumping over the trash cans with the barbed wires on it. I wanted to go back, but I couldn't. I was with my parents now. I needed to be happy, but that was not true. There was no happiness at home alcoholic father, um, religious fanatic mother that will hit me for not reading the Bible, and the abuse, physical abuse that we were going through, and nowhere to go for help. Until I went to, to um, sixth grade, I started hanging around with the wrong group of kids that I felt I had. I felt some attractiveness, too, because they were Central American and they were going through similar issues. And uh, once I got to junior high, I had stopped talking with the Salvadoran accent to assimilate in the schoolyard and not be persecuted by other kids. Once I got to junior high, I met other kids that had taken a different way of dealing with their culture clash and discrimination. And they have formed a little group of folks that were being called the Mara Salvatrucha Stoners 13 gang. At the moment, it wasn't a gang. It wasn't considered a gang. It was to protect themselves from those other folks that were trying to, you know, uh, persecute them because of where they were from, because they had had an accent, because they were different because they were easy targets. And um, I was attracted to that. And I joined them. And I became part of that. And not long after that, I started getting in trouble, ran away from home. And eventually, I was being arrested. My parents uh, took advantage of, of, um, of the immigration uh, uh, benefits and the early mid mid eighties, but I wasn't able to um, get any relief because I was already in the juvenile camp. And once I got out, I couldn't leave to get my papers because I was on probation. But by this time, I had no sense of importance of what a social security card was. I had no sense how it was going to benefit me to have a green card or not. I didn't find any value of it. All I knew was that I was feeling good, and I was have found a way to release that anger, hatred, and that I felt inside, and that was through violence. That was what I learned in the streets. So it took me to prison, and eventually was deported to El Salvador. Once I got deported to El Salvador, it was an eye-opening because I felt in some ways I was going back home. I was going to a place that uh, I wasn't going to have a criminal record anymore. I was going to a place where I could have a fresh start. I knew English pretty well, so I figured I could become like a tourist guide or something and make a living. And away from all the violence that I was kind of tired of being involved in. Unfortunately, the first impact was arriving and nobody's there for you at the airport. How do you get to an address you only have it written on the paper? And once I did finally arrive to where I was going to, I was threatened the second day I was there. And I realized that the gangs were there as well. So it was difficult to get away from all of that. But eventually, you know, I did. And I did for two reasons. I did because I came back because I was a father. My son was born this last time I was in prison. And I wanted, for the first time, I wanted to stay in this country. 
because I had not seen my son. But the other reason was because when I arrived over there, the gang issue has been sensationalized in the media and demonized in such a way that people were afraid of just looking at somebody with tattoos. And the response had been creating a death squad to deal with the problem. La Sombra Negra, or the Black Shadow, came in and started killing gang members and people that had been deported. So I became a target. My name was on the hit list that was distributed to different communities. And I had to flee. I couldn't live. I, I, ran, I took off from home. I became homeless, just trying to shelter myself because I couldn't go back home because they were, super, they were overseeing my home, staking it out. So I eventually made it. And I went through the journey of coming here undocumented. I tried coming on the train, but it was just too difficult for me. I got robbed by, uh, by the Chapines, by the Guatemaltecos. So I went back and, and, then, and then paid off a coyote. So I came through, but I was deported twice from Mexico. And it was a difficult process that I understood what my parents went through, maybe not at the same level, but why the stories that I heard along the way of all these people coming was not for a dream or an American dream. It was survival. It was survival. It was about surviving and, sur and helping their kids c come up as well to help them deal and be, just have a better life than what they were going through. These people sell the last of their things they have to pay off the coyotes. And not all the coyotes are bad people. The coyote that brought me was, was really a good guy that gave everybody opportunities. You know, he was in that business. It was his business, but he wasn't treating us as a business, right? So I came here. I finally made it, you know, and I wanted to do something different. I wanted to change my life. I wanted to prove to my son that I could do it, but there were still no opportunities. And I had to deal with my own demons. I had to deal with what I had done in the community. I had to deal with what I had done to my own parents. So the process of transformation came about self-discovery, understanding that I had a cause. The cause was my son. Just to live long enough that he would understood that I was a good man after all, right? But in the process, of doing that, members of different gangs in El Salvador in 1996 got together because they didn't want to be part of the gang violence either. And they started, they helped in the University of Central America, Duca, with the research in which they brought in over 1,200 gang members, people that had been deported, people that were homegrown, women, young, old, and they went through this research. And one of the, one of the, they, they were able to be so effective that uh, they wanted to start an organization. They said, if we were able to bring all these kids for something good, then we could bring them back to do something else. And that was inspiring for me because I didn't want to be involved in none of that stuff anymore. But I, I was still labeled. I had my tattoos. Everywhere I go, I was labeled. So I was able to be introduced to, uh, to some of the folks that were part of this organization and went with them in a, in, a, in a conference. Some of them were some of my friends. And I went to Santa Cruz, and that's how I was able to be introduced to the line of work. Then I, uh, I found, uh, I, I met uh, Senator Tom Hayden at the time, and he had a, a, an organization called the Peace Process Network, in which was doing similar work. And, and, and that's how I ended up getting involved with, uh, with, uh, with the program. So eventually I decided to start something. And the church gave me space. We started recruiting some kids. And Cusack from the Cusack uh, family uh, was able to bring some volunteers. And we ended up having an art program that became a, a center place for many of the gang involved kids that were coming to the program that we were recruiting. The issue became 
then it became also a hot spot, especially that day with law enforcement. They couldn't understand and they didn't want to see the gang members get changed. The gang members could become part of society. The gang members could become leaders and advocates and help change what they've been destroying. And that's what we were creating in, 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 in the church. So we were persecuted. And eventually I ended up getting arrested, uh, became part of the infamous Rampart scandal, if you all remember. Many people have forgotten that. I became part, my case brought in the issue of how law enforcement was working with immigration, INS, during that time in, 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 in fast-track deporting people. So I was able to win a political asylum case in which I was granted asylum to stay in this country and be with my family. So I continued doing the work after that uh, and have continued doing the work till now. And I look at this issue that started happening earlier this year when we were invited to go to, uh, to meet with this circle uh, of folks, including uh, 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 the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, people from ORR and some search service providers in uh, Casa Cornelia in, in San Diego, where this issue was introduced to us before it hit the media. And we wanted to do something, and we were figuring it out before, you know, it hit the media, and then it was out of our hands. It was like, it was a big, serious issue. But we knew that we had been seeing this issue. I had seen many youth coming that were already gang involved that had never been in the United States before. And some of them were seeking help. Some of them were coming over to our office. We developed a tattoo removal program. They wanted to get their tattoos removed. They said, you know what, because I eventually will be arrested and because I have tattoos, I'll probably be deported, but I want to remove the ones that are noticeable, right? So there was a wave of individuals that were coming and fleeing because they were also being targeted by dead squads, or they had left the gang and the gang was even targeting them. So the question earlier today that I asked um, was, that I didn't finish was, how many of these individuals are also seeking asylum that are coming? And that's a question that is not being answered. How many of these individuals are fleeing the gang violence that they were part of at one point? Right? So it leads to what's happening now. You know, my story as a child immigrant is the story that these kids are going to. Our take in it has been what are you going to do after these kids are unified with their families? Are all services going to be stopped by the government? Service providers that are searching, that are seeking for them to be legalized? That's where we take place. So we've been called to some of the schools to do some work around this topic because we find, we have found that immigrant, newly arrival immigrants are fighting with the newly, uh, 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 newly arrivals that are Mexicans over differences. They're clashing with the culture. So we implemented a program that was called the Joven Noble, Character Development Program that addresses and, and, and satisfies some of the issues that was talked about earlier. You know, the, 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 the being, having pride in your culture, understanding who you are, you keeping those important things that relate to who you are in a different environment in which they need to be introduced to in order to be able to survive in the communities. Because it's a culture clash that's happening that we, as stated before, will not want these kids to be engaged in what they're fleeing from, from their home countries. Because those gangs were developed here. That violence was created here. And the uh, foreign policies that have been implemented against those gangs have perpetrated more, more of this violence in Central America. Carsey, the transnational anti-gang initiatives. Now uh, the Department of Treasury has named a first street gang in their, in, 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 as an international criminal organization. 
and they not they 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 are targeting with this pressure, which their initiatives say that they want to help maintain or create the law of land, but those policies have failed, and we cannot let those foreign policies that have created a cycle of violence in Central America, because that's what it is. We have found that, you know, there's been intervention by the U.S. in these countries in which has created a flow of people that migrate. In every country that there's been war, people flee and seek refuge here, ironically, which is part of the reason why many people are fleeing their intervention. Once they come here, they go through the same process. So we see that Central America has become this cycle of violence in which it's creating a vicious cycle of people fleeing and being deported and fleeing from violence. And that needs to stop. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there uh, and answer some of your questions. Well, what we've seen is that uh, we've we've seen Armenians, you know, they have they have adopted some of this t same same uh, same uh, behavior. You know, the Armenian power is uh, is one of the most notable gangs in the in the East Hollywood area. You have you know Filipinos that are having this culture clash as well. Uh, you know, uh, Pinoy. You know, it's it's it's, it's the gang. And you have the Cambodians in Long Beach also that have had this culture clash. And these are people that have become victims of violence and state violence in those countries that have come over here as refugees. And people expect them to be happy, you know, and, and, and take opportunities of, of what the United States are providing. But these kids are going to the trauma, the culture clash, and there hasn't been really a network of support which is what we're trying to create here with a different network of Central American organizations that we're speaking to in regards to providing those, those, uh, those resources that we lack, right? So definitely it happens. We were invited uh, to go do some work. We're waiting for the funding to do work in Staten Island with the librarians and the folks that were coming from Sierra Leone that was in conflict with the African Americans in those communities. So we find that it's beyond just being a Latino issue. That is, it, you know, we have the same thing with the Haitians in, 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 in Miami and whatnot. So we find that this is, this is an issue that needs to be dealt with in regards of uh, what we call uh, transcultural neticization, right? Or something like that. The, um, I can't, my tongue. But anyhow, this 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 is becomes a, a critical issue in regards of of of, uh, of figuring out what to do once the children are here. Well, definitely, you know, we're trying, what we've been doing is uh, first educating our own community. It's been critical because, you know, the most critical ones have been our own Central American agencies on the issue because they've been the victims of it themselves. So, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to get our own folks to jump on the bandwagon to see how can we address a problem, you know, differently, you know, that has been targeted before because we've seen that policies and initiatives here in the United States, especially in LA, who they consider the gang capital of the world, have failed. We have more gangs and more involved youth now than ever before. But we, the, the way that's been targeted is to suppression, more incarceration, more prisons, now private prisons. So we have to move away from those, from those policies and address it. And, but first we need to educate 
those those folks uh, in regards to different methods of uh, of uh, or opportunities that may arise. Thank you, Alex, so much for sharing such a very personal and powerful story. And I have a feeling the lack of questions comes from the impact. Very, very powerful. If you were here about 4 o'clock this afternoon, we'd all have time to process and say, I wish I had asked Alice, uh, Alex. Thank you again. Very powerful. Uh, our closing keynote speaker is Javier Starring. <coughs> He's a co-director of the Office of Restorative Justice of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He started volunteering at Central Juvenile Hall in 1990, and it is there where he found his calling to minister with incarcerated youth. In 1995, he was hired by the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and since then he has overseen the largest Catholic detention ministry program in the nation. In 2002, he became co-director of the Office of Restorative Justice. In his capacity of co-director, Javier supervises the Catholic detention ministry programs at all juvenile halls and probation camps in Los Angeles, Ventura, and Sar Santa Barbara County. His responsibilities also include overseeing the restorative justice programs of ministry to victims of crime and ministry to formerly incarcerated youth. And with that, I'm going to have him tell you all the other things that we need to know about him as he uh, tells us, <laughs> not all things, <laughs> as he uh, talks about his work with youth. Thank you. I, I was uh, fortunate to catch uh, maybe the, the last half of Alex's talk, and uh, I was telling Steve, you know, uh, I was really happy that Alex was here, but I, part of me regrets having uh, suggested him as a panelist because it's, it's tough to come after Alex. Um, but I know the incredible work that Alex does. I know that it's God's work, and I know how challenging it is as well. And what, what would you think is one of the most challenging factors that Alex and others, I'm sure that spoke before Alex, uh, have to overcome. <coughs> Doing the work that Alex does, what do you think might be like one of the biggest challenges? Well, I would say the mentality of law enforcement. Mental that's definitely up there. That's definitely up there. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Communi right. Communication, right. yeah. Indifference. 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 Like fostering and sustaining hope. Yeah. So all of those things are true. And, and uh, I don't know which one Alex would put at the top of that list. But um, we work with similar population. <laughs> he looked at law enforcement, right? Uh, we, we work with... Um, similar populations. And I would say that maybe connected to law enforcement is that law enforcement aren't the only individuals that think that way. So one of the greatest challenges from my perspective of working with these children is that many people don't see them as children. Many people don't even see them as human beings. Many people see them as something so different than their own children that they would like to see them disappear. That they think that the way to deal with these populations is to lock them up and throw away the key or send them to another country, but uh, don't uh, make me even go through the process of thinking, you know, I should be caring about this. Is it th that, that gets complicated, and it's difficult. You know, the, when, when we talk about 
solutions for these issues, uh, nobody's suggesting that this is easy. We're suggesting that these issues are difficult, but that they're worthwhile, and that they're our responsibility, you know? And so I want to share a little bit about um, some of the efforts that we've been involved with and put it in the context of um, the people that I have been so blessed with the opportunity to accompany for almost 25 years. And so I work within a system that over relies on punishment as a way of dealing with challenges and trying to um, advocate for a model that restores and that cares, right? And the challenge of doing that. To start, does anybody know uh, at what age is the youngest age that they lock up kids in juvenile hall? Anybody know? Eight. 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 You're cheating. You know, you, 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 you know these answers. So it can be eight. I, I've seen kids as young as nine, but it can be as young as eight years old. Right now, I was at juvenile hall last week, and, and the youngest kid was 11. So it's not you know, something that happens all the time, but our laws allow it. Does anybody know that? Does anybody know at what age, what's the youngest age that we can give a child a life sentence in prison? 14. 14. 14. And um, usually when I ask that question, people start saying six, some people say 10, you know, but it, it jumps around because there really isn't um, knowledge around these things. Right now, there's a, a reporter here from Sweden who writes for an educational magazine from Sweden, and she's doing a story on juvenile justice. And she said that when she was telling her colleagues that she was coming to California and that she would be meeting kids as young as 14 who were sentenced to die in prison, I said, what does that mean? What do you mean? What do you mean a 14-year-old? It is such a hard thing for people in other countries to even register. It's so barbaric, you know? And um, we are the only country in the world. We are the only country in the world that sentences people under the age of 18 to life in prison without any possibility of parole. And I think that the main reason behind this, the main reason that society has voted for these laws and allow these laws to, to go on the books and, and be enforced is because we have dehumanized and many demonized youth of color in particular. So it's easy to say, you know, give a 14-year-old, lock him up for life, because he's not, he's not a child, right? And what happened in the 80s and 90s was so misguided in terms of how we treat our children that, that are a challenge, children who commit horrific acts, was so misguided that it's been difficult to try to swing the, the pendulum back to just a little bit of sanity, right? Between, starting in the 80s, we built 20 state prisons in California from the 80s on. How many universities, Cal State universities, do you think we built? One. One. Back in the 80s, well, it was when Pete Wilson was governor. He actually, he ran on the platform of tough on crime, right? Vote me into office, I will protect your children against those monsters. That was his platform. And he would go and give speeches saying, in the near future, the generation of adolescent youth will increase by this percentage, and this is the reason we need more prisons. He wouldn't say this is the reason we need more parks, more libraries, more schools. He says, because this wave is coming, get ready, we better be ready and build more prisons. And it was during those times that this idea that 
there was this new generation of adolescents that were super predators and there's nothing we could do to help them, right? That, that all we could do is lock them up to protect ourselves. When, when I started out as a chaplain at Central Juvenile Hall, plus maybe about five miles from here, um, I sat down with a, with a young boy and I'm in conversation with him and in the talk it comes out that he uh, is from Monterrey, Mexico. And that's where I grew up. So we start talking about, you know, the city and where I grew up. And um, does, does anybody know what Cabrito is? Cabrito? Come on, my Mexicans. What's Cabrito? It's like goat meat. Yeah, goat meat. If you ever go to Monterrey, you got to go to Rey del Cabrito. Yeah, no, don't make that face. It's good. Goat meat's good. Um, so I asked this kid, and, and at the time he was 15 years old, and I asked him, have you ever had Cabrito? And he says, yeah, you know, my mom still cooks that dish. And he told me a story about how his mom would bring home live goats. And he says, you know, I remember this one time, my mom brings home a live goat, and um, he was in the backyard for a few weeks, kind of became our pet, you know, was eating the grass. And then the weekend comes, it's my sister's quinceañera, and mom tells him, mom tells him, mijo, Go grab your gun and kill the goat. So imagine growing up in that household first, where it's normal for your mom to say, go under your mattress, grab the gun, and kill the goat, right? So this kid says, you know, I went to the backyard. I had the gun. I'm looking at the goat. The goat's looking at me. He says, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And then he laughs, and he says, my mom had to do it. My mom had to kill the goat. And I said, well, hold on a second. You couldn't kill a goat, but you're here accused of killing another kid. How does that happen? And he immediately told me, he said, that goat never did anything to me. And then he went on to tell me a story that I've heard a version of over and over and over again. And that is, I was walking down the street with my homeboy, my road dog, like my brother, my best friend. A car pulls up. These fools jump out and start shooting. We're running, and I just feel that my homeboy dropped to the ground. And he says, and I stopped, and I had him in my arms, and I think that the last thing he told me was, tell my mom that I'm sorry. And he said, I'm not sure that that's what he said because there was so much blood coming out of his mouth, but I think that's what he said. Imagine being, at that time, a 14-year-old boy who has his brother die in his arms, who grows up in an environment where it's normal, you know, to have the gun and to, where grows up in an environment where he doesn't have the people around him that he can talk to, that can help him process these feelings of anger and loss. That where he grows up, the way you deal with this is you go get one of them. In this kid's mind, the only way he was going to honor the memory of his brother was to go get one of them. In this, guy's, in this kid's heart, the only way he was going to deal with that pain was let me get them to feel what I'm feeling because nobody seems to care what I'm feeling. So it's not that he was an evil kid. He couldn't even kill a goat, right? But it's, the reality is Hurt people hurt people. And if you sit down, if you ever have an opportunity, a great opportunity of going into juvenile hall and meeting some of these kids and listening to their stories, and you, you hear about some of the horrific things that they've done, but you ask them about their childhood, and you go deeper, you can always trace these horrific acts that they've committed, trace them back to horrific acts that were committed to them. Hurt people hurt people. But the good part is that healed people heal people as well. And, and some of the great, greatest uh, uh, peacemakers, healers, 
right here, you, you got Alex, you know, people that have lived the experiences, people that have made it through this experience, know what it's like, have found deep down inside uh, an inner strength, many times a connection with God, and that they're going to use that to help other kids not go through what they've gone through. How much time do I have left? 15, wow. We're gonna start talking slow. <clears throat> um, when you come into juvenile hall and you sit down with the kids there and you listen to their stories and you get to know them and you find out what the truth is and you find out that the truth is that they were born into environments of abuse of all kinds, of neglect, of loss. And you find out that they were born with two strikes against them. And they're ignored. They're put into systems that are supposed to serve as safety nets, foster care system, mental health care systems. And what these systems do many times is just funnel them into the delinquency system. And it isn't until they're in this Delinquency, delinquency system that now we're paying attention, that now we want to see, okay, now how are we going to handle this kid, right? When I say the word justice, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Word association. Justice. Fairness. Rehab. Solution. When I say justice system, the justice system, what word comes to your mind? Prison. Lockup. Punishment. Yeah. Loss. So whose definition of justice is this, right? Whose definition of justice is this? And the reality is that I work with a lot of victims of crime as well. And their experience of going through this system is anything but healing. This myth that, you know, as soon as uh, the perpetrator gets convicted, you will find closure is something that leaves people empty at the end of the trial. This idea that, you know, my son was taken away and as soon as that mom's son is taken away, I'm gonna feel better, does not bring healing. I, yesterday was at Calipatria State Prison and I visited with a young man named David who five years ago I accompanied him to Compton Court for the day of his sentencing. His attorney stood up and he spoke to the judge and he said, Judge, my client is 16 years old. He has no prior felonies. He did not hurt anybody. And the victim that, that, uh, of this crime uh, received a wound that, that was superficial and was in and out of the hospital the same day, right? So David was with his homeboy. They ran into a couple of enemies in their mind, a couple of enemy gang members. His homeboy shot at them, grazed one of them in the butt, grazed them in the butt, and uh, thank God that kid was in and out of the hospital the same day. That, that's the scenario. After the attorney sits down, the judge says, Mr. Negrete, you wanted to act like an adult, and I'm going to treat you like an adult. And she sentenced him to three life sentences. Three life sentences. He didn't hurt anybody. He was just there when it happened. 16 years old, no priors. I went to visit him yesterday to... Um, to see how he's doing, obviously, but hopefully in some way 
to uh, keep his hopes up, which now I can do with a lot more honesty and with a lot more belief than when I first started. When I first started as chaplain, and I remember one time that I walked into the unit and I said, I'm going to go talk to this kid because I heard he just got 100 years in court. He just got sentenced to 100 years. And that kid says, Javier, thank you for visiting me, but that kid over there got 200 years. He's worse than I am. Can you go talk to him? And when I would sit down with them and I would say, you know, you got to keep the hope. Things can change. Honestly, it felt like something that I had to say, but I didn't really believe. Because that wasn't the reality around us, right? Back then, you, you received seven years to life. You were never seeing the streets again, much less 100 years, 200 years. But I would say this to them. Yesterday, when I said it with sitting down with David, I had concrete facts that helped me tell him, you know, there is a chance you'll get out. In the last two years, two very significant bills were passed, SB9 and SB260. SB9, what, it, what this bill did was any young person under the age of 18 who was sentenced to life without possibility of parole now has the opportunity after serving 25 years, nobody's getting out of prison, nobody's walking out. After serving 25 years, this individual can go before the judge again and say, this is how much I've changed. I was a kid when I did it. I'm not a kid now. coalition of, of legal advocates, faith-based leaders, and the most important group, directly impacted community. Not only the parents of these young people, but the people in prison as well. They gave input to, these, to this campaign, to this movement. What we said to each other over and over again, because it was so clear, is that this movement is bigger than the bill. This movement is bigger than that law. So even though there's the disappointment, there's, we knew that something bigger was happening. We knew that families who had left that courtroom crying in despair now felt empowered, now felt energized, that they were involved in something that was going to change these draconian pro, uh, practices, that they were involved in something and, and many of them would say, I don't know if this will ever help my son, but it, I'm giving it my all. I'm giving it my all. It brought them life in the same way that it brought life to um, the young people serving the sentence. To know 
wow, I, I didn't know there were so many people out there that even knew I existed, much less that cared enough to be involved in something that, that's going to help me out. That brought life. One of the biggest challenges that we had going to Sacramento and sitting down with, with legislators and telling them that, that we need to get the, these bills passed was that legislators would say, you know what, I hear you, I, 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 I agree, you know, we shouldn't be doing this, but I'm on the side of the victims. I'm on the side of the victims and I, I need to really be considerate of what they're telling me and they're telling me they don't want these kids ever to get out. But with the victims that I was working with, I was hearing different stories. I was hearing different stories because the group that I was working with came from the same community where the kids were being um, thrown away to the prison system for life. I know moms who on Saturday come visit their kid at juvenile hall and on Sunday go to the cemetery and visit their other son. They've experienced both sides and they know that the system doesn't work for either side. And so three years ago, we developed a program called Healing Dialogues in Action. And it's where we bring together, we bring together mothers who have had a child murdered, not just mothers, family members who have a child murdered with family members who have a child serving life sentences in prison. And we, we bring them together and we, uh, it's usually about 30 people in a group, 15, on uh, the survivor side and 15 on the side of those serving the time, the, the family of the incarcerated. And then we break up into small groups of four to six with even numbers, and they just tell their stories. I mean, first we, we talk to them about what compassionate listening means, what it looks like, and the power for healing that exists in not only telling your story, but having people around you that can uh, understand and are open, open ears and open hearts to accept your story. And if you were to walk into that room and you hear a couple of, uh, of the, the parents sharing their story, you'd be hard pressed to figure out, wait a minute, is that the mom whose son is in prison or is that the mom whose son was murdered? Because the pain the journey is so similar. And what happens in these groups is that the mom who um, has a son in prison telling her story and the mom who, whose son was murdered starts identifying in the pain, in the emotions, in the feelings, and starts empathizing. And they offer support. And so, it, it's, it's the most healing work that I've been a part of. And, and we've had uh, participants say, I've been to every therapist you can imagine. You know, my child uh, was murdered 12 years ago. I've done all the therapy. Nothing helped me as much as this one gathering. And then we offer them, for those who, who wish to participate, in opportunities to change the system, to change the thing so that those coming after them don't have to experience the same thing as bad as they did. And so when we finally got SB9 passed, it was traveling to Sacramento with a mom on one side of the legislator telling her story about her son murdered, and the mom on the other side of the legislator telling, the, telling him that um, her, her son is in prison for life, and both moms saying, this is wrong and we need to change it. And so now, instead of having legislators say, you know, I can't give you my vote uh, out of consideration for the victims, now when the bill passed in their, uh, you know, um, the comments on the floor, we had legislators saying, I just met with the victim who's asking me to vote yes on this. And so these are groups that we've been told definitely by the system, I think our culture, you know, that they're on opposite sides and choose what side you belong to. Because if you're here to support the survivors, that must mean you're for tougher penalties and lock them up and throw away the key, right? And if you're here to support the incarcerated, that must mean you just want them out and, you know, but it's not that way. It's not that way. And what that taught us 
more than anything is, well, he taught us a lot of things, but um, being able to work with the unusual suspects, if you will. Being able to identify people that you might think are just by, you know, who they represent against your views. And uh, that, that, that was uh, n not only, I don't want to say a powerful lesson, because it was so much more than that, but it, it was something that, that was key in getting the legislation passed. And I think I'm opening up for okay. questions. Okay. Yes. Yes. The life, the, the life sentence for a child. Yeah. I'm sorry, thanks. Definitely the murder is wrong. I mean, that goes without saying. But what the story was that they were sitting next to the legislator and they were both telling him it's wrong to do this to children, which is sentence them to die in prison. Yeah. So in 2005, this wonderful country of ours uh, came to the realization that it's wrong to execute children. So in 2005, we stopped executing people under the age of 18. Uh, California wasn't executing children even before that, but 19 states did have that practice. But what a lot of people will, will argue is life without parole is just a slow death sentence. Okay. Uh, sentence. Not sentence. Com when uh, they committed the crime. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there are children who are 17 when they are uh, accused of the crime, and their court could go three years, you know. So now they're 20 at the day of sentencing. But yet, yeah, uh, it applies to when the crime was committed. Mm -hmm. Is there an appeal process for juveniles? Yeah. And so is there an appeals process? Uh, any life sentence? Uh, is eligible for automatic appeal. Of those appeals, 10% of them get heard. Of those cases that are, are appealed, 10%. And of those 10% that get heard, 10% get overturned. So it's very, very, I mean, Alice can tell you a lot of examples, but the, the, the most common um, reason for an appeal is because you got a bad lawyer, right? bad representation in court. Um, to prove that your lawyer was so much worse than the average lawyer takes a whole lot. So I've known of cases where the lawyer fell asleep during the trial. The lawyer had a heart attack during the trial. None of those things overturned cases. Another reason for appeal is extreme sentences. David. David, who I visited yesterday, three life sentences, did not hurt anybody. He appealed his case on, ex on the fact that it was an extreme sentence for the circumstance, and he lost that. If that is not an extreme sentence, what is then? And he has some great attorneys. He has a, a friend from uh, Loyola Law School representing him. As a, I, I don't know the details, to tell you the truth, but he, he lost it uh, earlier this summer. So now he's, he's going for another appeal. You know, it just keeps going up. But, uh, yeah. And, 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 and your work inside juvenile halls and, and, and prisons, how often do you encounter a lot of uh, undocumented juveniles? Right. 
Um, you know, it used to be a lot easier to tell because they would house, when, when they did, uh, I don't know how many years ago, they stopped the practice of uh, locking up youth in these detention centers where, where I work. Um, back then they had a unit, unit TV, where they housed all the undocumented youth, so it was easy to know. And uh, INS paid probation a fee for how many beds, you know, and that's where they had them. Now, I, I can't really give you a percentage. Um, they don't bring them just for being undocumented, but if they commit, if they're accused of, of a crime that locks them up, uh, you hear of a lot of cases where, you know, an option that they give them as a deal is get deported, you know. Either get deported or do some time in camp and but I, I can't give you a number as to how frequent that is. Many, many of them, if the crime is serious enough, they do the crime first, and then, I mean, they do the time first, and then as soon as they finish their time, they get sent to an ICE facility and do time there, and then once they're ready, they pick them up, they take them to TJ, and give them $200 and say, okay, don't come back, because we'll give you 10 years if you do. Yeah. That's exactly, yeah. Yeah. Also to be able to have these conversations with the team, not they don't abolish the term from program violence and stuff right. like that too. So like what else do you recommend for, for that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that when we have these conversations about uh, root causes of crime, how to stop violence, you know, how do we address violence, that for the most part they fall into two groups, right? You you have the conservative, if you will, that says you know, every human being has a choice. It's personal choice. So if that person chose to pick up a gun and do that, that's his choice. Deal with him as an individual. And then you have uh, maybe the more progressive um, view, and, and you talk about, uh, you know, racism, and you talk about lack of education, good educational services, lack of mental health, lack of medical. And there's one piece that I think is missing all the time from this conversation, and that is the piece of hurt people hurt people. And so many of the, the people that I, we accompany are people that, yes, need a job, yes, need better schools, but you need to address the pain. You need to address the, the violence, because if not, that cycle of violence is uh, a lot uh, easier that it, that, that it will continue. You know, so along with all the social services that we need, we need to start looking at uh, emotional, spiritual needs, and that be the focus, right? How, c how can we help these people that have been injured get to a better place so that they're not acting out of that hurt, so that they're not acting uh, in, in horrible ways out of the horrible actions that, that were brought upon them. And how do you start having those conversations? I, th I think that you start having them with the people that are open to the solution because we're not even having that conversation at that level, I think. And you start bringing in, you start connecting the dots. You know, so you, you bring in the, the, the educators, you bring in the social workers, you bring in the, the, the progressive policy makers. Nothing is easy, nothing is easy, but it's worth it. Thank you.
And so we leave today with uh, thoughts just bouncing around. I mean, it's, I have about a thousand comments, no questions, but a thousand comments. <laughs> and I'm sure that must be a feeling shared by many. Um, so much material shared today and then this powerful ending with, and what do we do now? How do we begin to affect change at multiple levels and looking at, at sources rather than at symptoms uh, and investing in our youth in the future. Um, I remember attending a seminar with Marian Wright Edel Edelman one time when she said that what we offer our youth in this country, when a, when a child is born, we do not ensure that they will get an education, that they will have food to eat or a house to live in, but we do ensure that if you make a mistake and create a problem, we will punish not a way for us to be seen by the world, I would hope. Um, so maybe what we are dealing with today and the theme that I feel coming through in all of these presentations is that we are at a time of remarkable change in many areas. Um, we heard about the roots and the origin of uh, uh, International Institute LA and what we heard was the change over a hundred years. And what we heard from Alex Morales was the change we could think about, that we could envision. And from Alex uh, Sanchez, the change that occurred within an, an individual that needs to be generally uh, available to young people in our society. And so maybe change. And what you are challenging with, uh, Javier, is this is an area of change that could make significant difference in our society. So my hope is that there has been uh, something meaningful for each of us to take away today. And uh, I want to congratulate Stephen and his board for a wonderful day and a very memorable day. So thank you very much. And with that, we are free to go.